allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Note for the record that all council members are present except Mayor Conway, who is unable to join us this evening. Thank you. Um, that moves us to the agenda. And uh, do we have any changes, additions, or deletions? Mm -hmm. I have um, a, a suggestion to remove um, item B2 under old business. It's the GVMID resolution because we have a separate meeting agenda at the end of this meeting that will cover that item. Could, could I ask a question about that? Sure. Um, I guess this is a city attorney question. <laughs> uh, can we just uh, combine the two meetings like we usually do? Uh, uh, or does it really require two separate meetings because of the circumstances? Um, it's on. Okay. It's on. Um, if we had an agenda that was noticed as a joint um, a meeting of both bodies, then it could be combined into one discussion. But if you want to do it here, you would need to um, do it as a council, and then you could do it again at the end of the meeting where you have separate a separate agenda item um, to deal with um, the, uh, the action you would need to take as a district. Um, if you prefer to do it all at one time, uh, it could be kicked to the next meeting as long as there isn't a timing issue. Um, and perhaps... No, we can't do it tonight in a combined way? That's my question. You, can, you can't. Can't. You cannot. All right. That was my question. <laughs> all right. And then also we want to, um, and I'm not sure if we do that here, we're changing the title of the ordinance um, on new business item B to the um, disposable. I think that you could actually, when that item comes up, then we rename propose it. that change to the ordinance rather than modifying the agenda now. Okay. And then if no one has an objection, I see that um, well, we have lips to speak on both items, so I guess leaving the orders fine. So if we have a motion to approve. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And that brings us to uh, proclamations and presentations. And item A is declaring um, October 2014 as Fire Prevention Month. <coughs> and do we have... Um, a member of the public that, or the fire department that would like to speak. Members of City Council, uh, thank you very much for declaring October Fire Prevention Month here in the city of Brisbane. You know, throughout the year, as the fire department, we were always out talking with the community about fire safety and importance of installing smoke alarms and, uh, and testing them in, in their homes. But uh, the month of October is a very special month for us because it's really where we really ramp up our efforts and we're out there in the community promoting fire safety. Uh, this month, our firefighters will be going to both of our schools and talking with the students about the importance of installing and maintaining smoke alarms in their homes, which also is the, the theme this year through the National Fire Protection Association as well. We'll also be out Saturday, a day in the park. We'll have our uh, public education trailer out there and talking with the community and October Saturday October the 18th will be our fire service day open houses in Pacifica Daily City and here at station 81 in the city of Brisbane so we encourage everybody to uh, stop by that as well so on behalf of fire chief Ron Myers the Brisbane fire department and the North County of fire authority I'd like to thank all of you for declaring uh, the month of October fire prevention month here in the city of Brisbane thank you so this is the proclamation of the City of Brisbane declaring October 2014 as Fire Prevention Month. And whereas the City of Brisbane and North County Fire Authority is committed to ensuring the safety for and security of all those living and visiting our city and 
whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally and homes are the locations where people are at the greatest risk from fire and whereas U.S. fire departments responded to 370,000 home structure fires, these fires cost th caused 13,910 injuries, 2,520 civilian deaths, and 6 million, 6.9 billion in direct damages. And whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying and reported home fires in half, when a smoke alarm fails to operate, it is usually because batteries are missing. And whereas in fires considered large enough to activate the smoke alarm, hardwire alarms operated 93% of the time, while battery powered alarms operated only 79% of the time. And whereas an ionization smoke alarm is generally more responsive to flaming fires, and a photoelectric smoke alarm is generally more responsive to smoldering fires, for the best protection or when extra time is needed to awaken or assist others, both types of alarms or combination ionization and photoelectric alarms are recommended. And whereas the City of Brisbane and North County Fire Authority responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection, education and whereas the City of Brisbane residents are responsive to public education members, measures, and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. And whereas residents who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And whereas the 2014 Fire Prevention Month theme, Working Smoke Alarms Save Lives, Test Yours Every Month, effectively serves to remind us all of the leading cause of home fires and home fire injuries and we can take to stay s and we can take to stay safer from fire during fire prevention week and year round now therefore i terry o'connell mayor pro tem of the city of brisbane do hereby proclaim october 2014 as fire prevention month and encourage all city of brisbane residents to heed the important safety message of Fire Prevention Month 2014 and to support the many specific safety activities and efforts of fire and emergency services. And I would like to present this to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any comments from the council? No, just looking forward to seeing you guys on Saturday. Great. Yeah, we'll be out yeah. there. Yeah, I have one uh, question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, we're talking about smoke detectors here, and, and we know how important those are. Uh, but uh, what about the carbon monoxide uh, detectors? Uh, what's the situation on that? Well, it, it is now state law that they need to be in homes, in the in the, in the outside the bedroom and on on every level of the home for homes that either have an attached garage, uh, fuel burning appliances, or a fireplace. So if one of those three are present, then you have to have the carbon monoxide alarm in the home. And generally where that's being caught is obviously in new homes being built, or if you pull a permit for a remodel, uh, the building inspector is going to check to make sure that those are in. Just like traditionally where when the laws were changed where you had to have a, a smoke detector or an alarm in each bedroom, they would check when you did a remodel. Now that's also what they're checking for as well as the carbon monoxide alarm if it falls in that criteria where you have the attached garage or gas fuel appliances or a fireplace in the home mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that moves us to oral communications number one, or excuse me, presentations Beth Grossman for imaging. Thank you all so much for inviting me to report on the first United States Department of Arts and Culture imagining that took place right here in Brisbane. And um, 
uh, in the summer of 2014, a new people-powered United States Department of Arts and Culture produced a series of 15 imaginings in towns and cities across the United States. Each imagining was an arts-infused uh, collective visioning of the future for that community. I am a nationally selected cultural agent for the Bay Area for the United States Department of Arts and Culture, which I'll now call, U call USDAC. Um, these acts of imaginations brought together diverse groups of artists, activists, community members to firstly envision their communities in the year 2034, 20 years from now. When the transformative power of arts and culture has been effectively integrated into the fabric of society. And secondly, uh, to begin to strategize the creative tactics for how to get there. So I designed our imaginings especially for Brisbane and it was held at the community center. There we go. Uh, July 13th uh, uh, and um, I thank the city of Brisbane so much for the uh, support that we got for, by, for allowing us to use the space and some staff time. And um, so basically, I invited uh, participants to be citizen journalists, and, as and they we assembled to create the first issue of the Imagining Times. And our tagline is, living the news we want to read. We had a three-hour press deadline to write and illustrate the newspaper filled with headlines and articles, collage pages that describe our community 20 years from now with art and cu culture at the core of all initiatives. And here's my... Uh, planning committee. These are all my facilitators. We had uh, 50 pl plus feet people, so we needed a lot of people to lead small groups. So when people came in, they, they signed in and were invited to make uh, creative badges that explored the idea art is. You'll recognize a number of Brisbane residents in this presentation. It's uh, Jeff Cotton. And uh, here's an example of one of the beautiful badges that people made. And then we started the event. We were honored to have our um, USDAC chief policy wonk, Arlene Goldbard. And um, she came and we did a typewriter ribbon cutting ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> and I chose the typewriter because I really wanted to give a sense of like the old newsroom where you know you would have a deadline and every the, the typewriter would be clicking away. And um, really wanted to also symbolize the idea of really going low tech and that this was really about people connecting and thinking together and creating with each other offline. So here's the group of 50 plus uh, citizen journalists assembled in groups and they were led by editors that were heading up editorial departments of um, immigrate, immigrant and human rights, the natural world, environment, technology, <coughs> social systems, health, public space, faith, spirituality, and community, celebrations, education, and of course, anarchy. And there was a large group of 20-somethings in that group. <laughs> so, uh, the directions were uh, to imagine that you're in the present moment 20 years from today and your job as a citizen journalist is to represent what our, communi our community and the world looks like to somebody who knows nothing about it. Create a page for our newspaper filled with a headline, short article, and collage drawing that describes our community tw in 20 years with art and culture at the core of all initiatives, and then write it in the present as if it was happening when you wake up to read the newspaper in 2034. So we, did, we got to explore the idea of what do you hope to see right here in our community? What could this place look like? If we, were brought to, if we brought our full creative selves to envisioning and building it? And how can we make it real using the power of art and culture? It was a lot of energy and we had great magazines and everyone was trading images and working together. It's one of my favorites, cutting the defense department, literally. <laughs> And following an hour of working together on individual pages that envisioned our future, uh, the pages were shared among the editorial group, and then the editor reported back to the large group, and notes were taken on large paper on the wall. So here's some of the highlights, and remember that people were invited to think big, crazy, and out of the box. So, um, 
So public spaces are sustainably designed and provide natural environments for community interaction. Uh, freedom of communications is a human rights across all borders and pidgin languages function as a lingua franca. The Department of Anarchy reports that Hollywood has been destroyed along with its confining images of body and gender standards. <coughs> Our social systems are a sweet, crazy monsoon of life with easily accessible and available health, um, healthy foods, affordable and sustainable housing and energy. Mental issues are now a thing of the past because people feel connected and um, working in community. The health editorial department reports that wrinkles are now a fashion statement and grandparents <laughs> are involved uh, with raising healthy grandchildren. Big agriculture and big pharma are dead, replaced by small plot organic farming and the return to ancient herbal knowledge for all healthcare needs. Uh, the, department of, the editorial department of the natural world declares that we have everything we need right here. All knowledge of our environment is available. If we listen and connect with networks of nature to educate ourselves, heal and create harmony with nature. Education is completely free and accessible to all individuals. Of all ages, it's not standardized, there's no teaching to the test, and art and the wonders of science are central to all aspects of education. So um, afterwards, um, my amazing group of uh, editors and facilitators stayed on late into the evening to debrief and help organize and scan the pages of the Imagining Times, and it's uh, posted online. I just, I'll give you a real quick preview, and then maybe we can post the link eventually. And uh, while she's setting that up, in work, and we also propose the idea to print the newspaper and then to bury it in a time capsule on San Bruno Mountain, and we'll unearth it in 20 years from now and see the vision that we uh, let's see. Maybe go back a couple, one page there. There we go. So there's the headline, and then just you can just sort of flip through it kind of quickly and get a sense of some of the beautiful collages that people made. Uh, we'll post it online so you can have a chance to actually read it if you'd like. Yeah. And then just if you go back to the PowerPoint for one more picture. And so finally, uh, the very last one. Finally, in closing, we all got together, we stood up, and uh, we said together, this is an act of collective imagination. So the next step for, there we are, so it was a great group of people, and the next step for the United States Department of Arts and Culture is that I'm going to be opening a field office in the Bay Area, um, and there will be other field offices uh, opening around the rest of the country. The key cultural agents are all getting together in uh, New York uh, in November to plan the future. And um, I also want, I'm happy to be able to share this with you because I think it's, this is also, this kind of a tool is a great way to do envisioning for other kinds of city, city projects that we might want to see happen because it, it creates a, an environment where everybody's really working together and they're being creative and their hands are moving and um, there's a, a way that ideas can happen that we might not imagine otherwise. So thank you so much for all of your support. We couldn't have done this without a Brisbane, City Brisbane support for the arts. Uh, that, that is awesome. Uh, Beth, um, mm -hmm. so when is the field office going to be open? Um, sometime in the next year. I'm, I'm in the process of organizing it, and I'm also trying to strategize how to, like this is the center because I'm here, but I need it to really encompass the whole Bay Area, and I'm also uh, reaching for the um, most diverse um, participants and communities that I can reach. So that's going to take some time and some relationship building. So I guess the field office probably won't be in Brisbane. I don't know. Well, I'm here, so there's a good yeah. chance that it could be. All right. <laughs> yeah. I think mm -hmm. that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. It'd really, it would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Think about it. Okay. Well, I'll be happy to talk with you more about that. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Hmm? No questions or comments? 
I just want to thank you for you know putting this together and reaching out and finding out <coughs> if this is even possible. It's it's great to see the community come together, and I can see from the pictures that in, in that there were people there from even outside of Brisbane who came. I recognized a couple of Daly City residents, and so um, I think that it was a success, and um, look forward to maybe seeing it again. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I do have a, a one thing that's not clear to me, and I'm sure you can answer the question. Mm -hmm. um, it's not clear to me what this initiative is trying to accomplish on a, it's a national program, right? Mm -hmm. So what are they trying to do? Well, so a lot of people say, the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture, is there one? And we always answer, there should be. And so the idea is that we really are trying to, um, it's not just like an art world organization. This is a, an organization that really wants to champion the power of arts and culture in all aspects of society and as a way of building community, mm -hmm. providing, giving people a sense of connection and meaning in their lives, um, ways of uh, creating a sense of place in towns and communities, ways of working in city government. Um, basically, the idea, too, that I have often promoted is that there needs to be an artist at every conference room table because lots of times just the fact that I'm sitting there, it it just people will like start to open up and think in a, in a more creative way, a more connected way, thinking about, you know, the sense that when I – when I take one action, my action is always going to impact others. And I think that that's one of the things that that having a, an artist at the table in any kinds of decision making and planning always um, brings people together to think in that way. So that would be sort of one of the primary initiatives. And just also creating a sense of uh, diversity, connection between communities, um, supporting communities. The, one of the things that the USDAC did recently with the Ferguson shooting is they, they put out a call and a whole lot of very um, important activists and artists all got together to say we've got to put an end to this and how can we um, make a call for artists to really support that, get the word out and so we're taking on all kinds of different issues also around the environment, um, around, around the climate march that happened in New York. Uh, there was a lot of United States Department of, of uh, arts and culture activity and also helping people find out how can they engage to participate in other those larger events. So this is one way too to really connect Brisbane to a, a larger national okay. organization. So, but how is it funded? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, not very well at this point. <laughs> um, it's, it's a volunteer organization top down. They're, they had some seed money to kind of get things started and get a website up and, and that kind of thing. But um, now that the first effort was to like kind of get the word out and get cultural agents to go out and create these imaginings. They're um, also asking people to sign up as citizen artists on their website and asking people, how do you want to become involved? What kinds of skills do you have? What would you like to see happen in your, community, in your communities? And then from there, they're hoping to really build enough momentum to, to secure some funds to be able to support people to do primarily the leadership work, which is, a, a, as you can imagine, takes a lot of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beth, it sounds like a very interesting uh, relationship building or, uh, organization. And uh, I, what is a wonk? <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to answer that. It's just I think she wanted, you know, they kind of wanted to play off the idea of, you know, kind of what happens in uh, in our government sometimes when people just go on and on and on talking and trying to. So I think there was it was kind of a a, a, a joke in her taking on that title. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I wish you luck with it, and um, I'm glad that the city could support what we have supported so far. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Beth. That brings us to oral communications, number one. And I have a slip from Michelle Salmon. Michelle Salmon, Brisbane resident. How could I resist coming up and speaking in front of the mayor pro tem, <laughs> <laughs> Terry O'Connell? Um, 
first of all, I want to thank Beth for the imaginings uh, because I attended and I thought, oh, God, getting drug into another thing. <laughs> and it was that's really. That's a you. Huh? That's a really nice picture of thank you. Thank you. Um, it really was an amazing event and it was very exciting. And I got all excited about it. Here I am cutting up magazines and making a collage like I haven't done in, in decades. Um, and it, it was very uh, visceral and, and made me feel very connected. And so often nowadays in our education system, it's, it's SMET, you know, science, math, engineering, and technology. That's what's crammed down the kids' throats and, um, and placed at a high value. And we forget about how important art and culture is in inspiring us to a higher level of humanity and how often art uh, speaks so much uh, louder than uh, words. And a good example of that was last week at the Recology Artists in Residence. Um, there was an absolutely amazing piece done by a Brisbane resident, Jerry, I mean Jeremy Rourke, and it just knocked my socks off and it was all done with garbage. And it really made you uh, feel this interesting connection with how we move through time and what we do with the resources we have. But that's not why I put in my slip. I put in my slip because, first of all, I'm really glad to see those dumpsters gone. I think they became an, an attractive nuisance. But the problem that they were to alleviate has not gone away. Indeed, it's gotten worse because of the dumpsters being an attractive nuisance. There is an incredible amount of garbage tucked away still on Tunnel Road, and it's now appearing in lots of other places. I noticed whenever the dumpsters were like full or closed, Garbage would appear now on, you know, Gualabi Canyon Parkway and over on Lagoon Way and on Sierra Point Parkway and everywhere else. And so the city of Brisbane needs to take a hard line in curbing that. And one of the things that made me think about it a lot was this connected thing, this, this um, circulation element of the general plan. Um, and on here there's a part where it talks about... Um, purpose of the parent users of streets roads and highways means of bicycles children's persons with disability motorists movers of commercial goods pedestrians users of public transportation and seniors and yet we persist in allowing tunnel road to be in the state that it is in which is extremely dangerous not only for vehicles but for pedestrians bicyclists anybody else and animals who might be traveling along that road and i drive it every day on my way to work there is no place to pull over if somebody comes across the double line because the sides are covered with rubble, debris, rocks, pieces of concrete, you know, bushes that have absolutely grown, overgrown the roadway, and it is dangerous. And God forbid somebody should want to ride their bicycle from the train station to one of our facilities here in town. The other day I'm driving down Tunnel Road, guy's on a bicycle coming towards me, you know, and he's on where he's supposed to be, and here's this big old truck going around him, coming completely into my lane to pass the bicyclist, and I have nowhere to go. I am already to the edge of the pavement. It's dangerous, and we persist in allowing UPC to main that, maintain that property like a dump. And now we have um, the, this new, a lot more traffic because Golden State Lumber has increased and now they're crossing across the road with their trucks pulling in and out without looking. We have the paratransit people now on Tunnel Road with a whole lot more heavy traffic there. We have increased tr truck traffic from the um, soils processing and soils uh, storage place and it's dangerous and I think the city council and the city staff need to take a hard line with UPC and make them clean up the damn road and the sides of the road so that it meets safety stand minimum safety standards and while I'm at it the Brisbane police need to have a talk with the um, tankers that come in in the morning and blow through the right hand turn from northbound Bay Shore onto Tunnel Road and they don't stop at the stop sign they just blow right on through. They kind of look and phew. And I, I pulled over one day and actually went in there and yelled at one of them and said, you can't do that. And I talked to the general manager and he said, well, we can't control the drivers. So the city needs to pay attention to those things because it really, that whole area is a safety hazard 
and I know UPC kind of holds it over our heads, and I'm sorry, it just doesn't fly anymore. And I'd also like to know, while I'm having been here for a while, uh, how are you measuring how high the dirt piles are? I know we had set it now at 75 feet above a medium, median sea level rise, or whatever it is. I'm sure your staff can tell you exactly what it is. But I'd like to know, is it being measured and monitored on an ongoing basis? Because um, not only is the pile getting really, really wide, it is getting really, really high. And I noticed tonight when I got off the freeway, you can't see the mountain anymore when you get off the freeway. So I'd like to know what the monitoring status of that is and, and where we're at and what's the current height. And is it exceeding 75 feet? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, does any, I don't think we have any answers as far as um, pile heights at this time um, prepared or ready, but what do we know what the monitoring situation is uh, with that? <coughs> my understanding is that, I don't know if Randy feels comfortable responding to it or not, but my understanding is that the, they actually will be having less dirt than what was originally contemplated in the MOA uh, by the end of uh, the year. And they've actually have just uh, notified us a couple days ago that, <coughs> excuse me, that they got a contract to move 50,000 yards off of the site. So we actually may start to see some of the piles, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> having a tough time with my voice here, uh, 50,000 uh, uh, um, cubic yards off of the site. So we may actually see the piles coming coming down in terms of, of height in the near near future. Um, and there are some other contracts I, that they're working on with regards to that. Um, as far as the road goes, I mean, it, as we all know, it's uh, it, it's actually owned by Universal Paragon Corporation. And uh, it's a, <coughs> uh, there's a license that the city own, has to um, create a, a use for the public to use it. Um, it was actually, we looked at the, the license agreement this week because we had a, another cause to do so. And it goes back to 1976. I'm not, I'm not able to <coughs> really hear you there. I'm sorry. The, the license agreement actually goes back to 1976. And uh, um, I think we asked our city attorney to take a fresh look at it. But um, I think my reading of it anyway is that, you know, it, it definitely was always tied to the idea that the, a development would take place. And then that's the, the point in time that the, the road would be approved, the city standards, and uh, set, um, the city would take over the road. It's, it's interesting that that goes back almost 40 years. Mm. Um, and it's still in the same condition it is. We have been working with UPC um, in Recology, um, in Police Department, Public Works Department, my, myself, um, with regards to um, a um, renewed effort to try to keep the area clean from trash. As you know, you looked at some franchise agreements in the last couple of weeks. You'll be looking at some more um, next week with regards to waste removal, and that's part of it. Um, the on-call uh, responses is part, part of that, as well as just the requirement of the property owner to keep it uh, clean. Um, there's requirements under the regional water permit now that, uh, that are different from what they've been in the past. So there certainly is a uh, renewed reason for keeping the area clean of debris. Um, it's always probably going to be a challenge, um, but we are doing some, uh, some police work out there. We're going to be doing some signage. Um, the our property owner is going to be doing some uh, weed abatement, uh, shrub removal, um, and some uh, cleanup. And um, you know, we we certainly are going to try to make um, an ongoing effort. And you know, I mean, critique whatever you want in the past. Where this has certainly been something that's been a high attention for the city for some time, and we'll continue to do do what we can to try to keep it clean from debris. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm. Any comments? Or? No. Yes. Yeah, well, I always bring up, uh, just to make sure nobody forgets, you're talking about, you know, 40 years ago when this was all sort of set up, uh, a part of that agreement was that there would be a separate bicycle path. And it was, in fact, constructed, but over the years it's been obliterated. <laughs> and so when we get to talking with UPC about doing some some kind of remediation to deal with the dangerous circumstances of which there are a number, you know, one of which is the, is the lack of a separate bicycle path. And it, 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 I mean, I've mentioned that in a number of forms. It, it really is dangerous. And 
and yet you have the irony that uh, the San Francisco bicycle map actually directs bicyclists down Tunnel Road. Uh, if you look at the markings on the streets in San Francisco, they say bicycle path, you know, right down to the Bayshore train station, and of course they just continue on Tunnel. And uh, or uh, if you were there during the, you know, the the bike the bike de celebration of Biking Day, uh, it's amazing how many people commute on Tunnel Avenue by bike. A lot. Uh, so th it is a serious issue, and, uh, and I hope, um, I know that the Complete Street Safety Committee is uh, one of the things that they will be looking at is, is what to do about that. Um, and one of the things maybe we can do is to see if there's any way to resuscitate, you know, what used to be there. Yeah, we, uh, along those lines, we've asked the city attorney, and particularly, uh, specifically Teresa, uh, to take a look at the license agreement from 76 and to outline um, obligations of the parties with regards to obligations and rights of all parties involved. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that agreement actually precedes UPC's ownership, so yeah, they, they, they assumed it when they purchased the property. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, if you're very brief, Michelle. I don't understand why they're not held to the same weed abatement standards that other private property owners are held to, uh, especially along the roadway. So I don't understand why they're not held to the fire safety and weed abatement that other properties owners in Brisbane have been held to. I'm not quite sure we have staff that can answer that at this time unless... Um, I don't think we yeah, I'll, have an I'll, answer for that. I'll talk but. to the fire department about that. It's, I don't believe it's ever been considered a weed abatement area, but we'll, we'll take a look at that. And then if, um, if UPC is willing to do some of the tree trimming and shrub, shrub cutting back to give us a little more visibility on the road and perhaps a better opportunity for catching the, or a deterrent for the illegal dumpers, that might be helpful also. Yeah, I think their, their, their plan is, is twofold. One is to do just what you indicated, but also to create some barriers so that cars can't pull off the road for the purposes of um, being able to stop and dump, which is part of the problem. Well, that can be a double-edged sword if you can't pull off in an emergency either. So, When do you think that uh, we're going to get that correspondence, you know, that feedback from meeting with them? Well, we've been meeting with them. Um, and again, I've had the city attorney take a look at it. Again, this is a private property, and it's not subject to a, a permit per se. Yeah. So, um, you know, they, they're working on trying to do uh, to deal with this. Um, they have every incentive to do it because there's, you know, regional water board permit issues that we have that we can use in this, as an enforcement tool. Okay. Um, so uh, I think I think everybody here. I think it's fair to say that everybody that's involved in this is is working on it in good faith. You know, okay, nobody's yeah. blowing it off, nobody's shrugging it, shrubbing it off to somebody else. Everybody's trying to work on it. It's just, you know, a difficult issue. It's an isolated area that is just, you know, subject to this kind of uh, behavior, bad behavior that people, you know, have, or they'll, you know, feel that they can dump stuff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we're trying to deal with it um, through all the various angles. You know, the shrubbery clean up the making it more difficult for people to pull off the road enforcement signage um, you know if we can enforce we, we've got a provision in the waste in our agreement with South San Francisco scavengers and also agroecology that you know there'll be a kind of a reporting mechanism if there are dumps and they do find material within the dumps that could lead us to us uh, somebody that's uh, you know could be um, um, a suspect I guess <laughs> for lack of a better term um, so you know I mean I think we're going to pull out all the stops in terms of trying to deal with it as best we can. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. This is a, one of those perfect situations where it's be a great idea to bring in an artist <laughs> to solve this problem where people, we need to like call attention to a problem. We need to change behavior. Um, one possibility would be to work with ecology because they do have the artists and Redis residence program going on there say look we have this problem maybe you know engage the community and the artists uh, to engage the community and thinking about how we might beautify the area create signage create a community events around it um, lots of different possibilities 
So this just sort of makes my point of why there needs to be an artist at every table. <laughs> Thanks. Any help that you can give in the in the trash abatement arena would be <laughs> welcome. Would be very welcome. So thank you. Any other members of the public wish to speak on oral communications one? Moving on um, to the consent calendar. And it's to approve the city council minutes of August 21st, 2014. Item B is to authorize the staff to initiate an amendment to the circulation element of the general plan for the Complete Streets Act of 2008. Item C is to accept Brisbane's share, which is $568.90 of the Regional FEMA Firefighters Assistance, Assistance Grant for the purchase of fire ground survival training mobile trailer and instructor with the North County Fire and adoption of resolution 2014-41 authorizing the execution of grant agreements with the state of California. Is there uh, move approval? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And that brings us to old business item A to consider the adoption of ordinance 588 waiving the second reading and adding chap chapter 15.85 to title 15 of the municipal code and amending section 15.12.280 concerning an art in public places program. And do we have a staff report? Good evening, council members. Um, uh, City Attorney uh, Michael Rausch um, provided a staff report on this item. Um, at the last meeting, I understand that council had um, some amendments it wanted to propose to um, the legislation, and um, the staff report included a copy of the current copy of the legislation with those changes made um, in a red line fashion. So at this point, um, it's my understanding that the, the, the changes have been made and council's concerns have been addressed. And at this point, um, the ordinance is, is ready for adoption. Um, Sorry. So I, I reviewed the, the changes and I see that they all were made except there was one thing that I recall from and I have in my notes that, um, that Cliff had suggested. Um, so in the implementation guidelines section 15.85.060. I believe, um, Cliff, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you had suggested changing it from shall, as in the implementation guidelines, shall include these various provisions, A through F, to May, so that it wasn't required that all of them be addressed in the guidelines. And I wasn't sure if that was still something you felt um, strongly about but I wanted to bring that up that I noticed that change had not been made you know I, I asked my wife who was <laughs> quite involved <laughs> with this said, well what do you think of these uh, implementation guidelines she says yeah you know I think they should all be in there I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll leave it as shall instead of leaving it you know instead of putting it as may so I, I'm, I'm fine with it but you know I guess it's up to the council too so I can go either way I think they're all important items to have included. And so that they shall be re included would be, I think, a good thing unless someone else feels strongly otherwise. I think it's fine as is. Okay. We shall. Okay. Any other comments? No, no, I'm good. Do we want to open this up for mm -hmm. members of the public to speak? And I have no slips. Do any of the members of the public like to speak on this issue? Seeing no requests, I'll close the public hearing. And then council discussion. I think we're ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Do I, I have move, a motion I to move uh, adoption of ordinance number 588? I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Thank you. <clears throat> Which brings us to old business item B, uh, considering the formation of a new financing authority between the city of Brisbane and the Guadalupe Valley Water District in order to assist the financing of future city projects. Yes. Staff report. Um, so the purpose is to try and provide as many opportunities and options for the city to get the best ability to finance the projects we have going forward in the future. One of the methods that we have used in the past is the Brisbane Public mm -hmm. Financing Authority. What that has allowed us to do was to create lease revenue financing mechanism. So this is very similar to what you hear a lot of cities did in the 90s where they monetized their assets. So Pittsburgh got a lot of credit for this back in the late 90s where they leased out their own buildings to, they sold their buildings to a private company who then leased it back to the city. So that provided a cash infusion for Pittsburgh to do and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not Pittsburgh, California, um, to do a number of their capital projects that had been put on hold. And then they would pay lease payments to the, public, to the private company that had owned the buildings. And then at the end of the term of the lease, they would go revert back to the public entity. So what the city did um, a number of years ago was actually create its own entity that would be able to hold assets of the city, such as City Hall, such as the marina, or the swimming pool or other things and lease that back to the city. And then it would sell uh, lease revenue bonds to the public that would cover that for that value of that property and then that money would then be used for public projects and we've used it for a number of different areas such as our water and sewer um, tanks or such as our city hall remodel. And we would hope to be able to use it again going forward for something as simple as the water and sewer projects that we've got on the, um, that we need to do. We have about $5 million worth of projects that we need. So you either can do it as a lease revenue bond or you can do it as a rev revenue rate. Actually for the city hall we would, or for the, for the utility would do it for, as a, uh, for the rates. But if we have other projects like the marina dredging, if we were to finance that we would need to use that as a public financing authority. So there's a number of ways that you do it. The reason we cannot use the public financing authority in the future is the redevelopment agency no longer exists. And the original public finance, Brisbane Public Financing Authority was set up as a joint enterprise between the city of Brisbane, the Guadalupe Valley Municipal Improvement District, and the redevelopment agency. Now that the redevelopment agency no longer exists, the Brisbane Financing Authority cannot sell any new debt. It can still hold the old debt it has and the assets it currently has, and it can still pay off the debt it has, but it can't sell any new debt. So we need to change, we need to create a new financing authority. We have the ability to do that since we have the GVMID and the City of Brisbane. They can create a new financing authority. Um, one of the suggestions made by a council member was maybe we don't call it the Brisbane Financing Authority. That might be too much close to the Brisbane Public Financing Authority and there might be a confusion as to which entity hold, holds which assets. So the suggestion maybe is to, in the resolution, change the name to the Brisbane slash GMID Financing Authority. So it has both of those names in there um, and that would be one of the recommendations that we would make as to changing the name for that. Um, but this is a normal method for trying to help the city use the asset it, assets it has in the best way possible. And that's why we're looking to doing this. The resolutions have to be both adopt, adopted by the city of Brisbane and the Guadalupe Valley Municipal Improvement District. The GVMID will hold a meeting later in this evening for its resolution, but what's on the agenda right now for the city council is the city resolution. There was also a suggestion now that we have sent out the letter to um, utility users for the uh, utility um, bond um, or the utility projects and the utility rate increase that you can add a whereas on October 1st the city of Brisbane sent out a letter notifying property owners and water users of a potential rate increase to take effect in March to pay for utility uh, projects. 
So that would be another suggestion as to a, adding a whereas to this uh, resolution. And hopefully I didn't get too confusing in trying to explain what the purpose of why you do these things are. I as, apologize for that. As a point of clarification, would you repeat the proposed name change? Sure. The proposed name change is the um, Brisbane slash Guadalupe Valley Municipal Improvement District Financing Authority. So that way anybody who's buying debt created by this agency would know specifically who's backing this debt and where it's located. And basically this is changing, they, it's, it's changing our name because of the change in structure with the redevelopment agency. Correct, because the state eliminated, if the state eliminated redevelopment agencies, so therefore we can no longer issue debt uh, with the redevelopment agency as part of it. Because they don't exist. Because they don't exist. So they would never get their signature. We would never get. You would never. You're never going to have another redevelopment agency meeting in your life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just successor agency meetings. Okay. Um, any member? Any questions for staff? Well, just the only thing I would uh, point out, which I'm sure Stuart would agree with me, was that um, the way I look at what we need to do here. And I guess the city attorney wants to wait. We, uh, in terms of the financing authority, we're really talking about just adopting the resolution 2014-39 of the city of Brisbane. Yes. Uh, and then this, the second resolution, that will come up under the GVMID meeting. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, and then the other, whereas you were talking about, actually is with the, the, the resolution 36, talking about the... Uh, financing of the uh, water and sewer capital improvements. Yes. Right. So that's uh, having to do with resolution uh, 2014-36, which is item C. Am I right? Yeah, I thought it seemed like you combined them. No, I think that that would have to do with item one, the 2014-39. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't think so. Um, I think you know Council Member Miller is right. You're talking about when I read when I read the email, I yeah. was thinking, I was reading it about the same one. But I think you are right. No. You 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 meant that the other one was for thirty nine, not for thirty six. Right. The, yes, uh, or it's for thirty nine. It was for thirty six. Sorry, for thirty six, not thirty nine. Right. Yes. Can you clarify that? What was for 36? The, the renaming? No, the, the renaming is for 39. Okay. And then for 36, it would be to add a whereas that this, we notified the property owners and the rate payers of a potential rate increase. So I, I'm sorry for misreading that email. Okay, but we'll add that in then. In we're, not, we're not dealing with no, that. No, we're not doing that yet right now. That would be C. In items that will be in C. So the only changes we are making, if it's if it's okay with our um, council, is the changing of the name of the financing authority. Right. right. And, and and you can call it anything you, talk you would to like. The bond council about that. I did. You can call it any. He told me you can call it any name you would like. Right. Now, um, how how does adding GVMID clarify it? Because G the GVMID was a party to right. the, the prior one as well and so so I think the concern is if you know the previous one was the Brisbane Public Financing Authority and then naming it the Brisbane Financing Authority is very similar so people may get confused between the two of them where if you go Brisbane slash GVMID it's very distinctive from that so is that going to be like abbreviated as B G V M I D F A or just B G F A <sighs> I would say it'd be, be, you know, if we were to do it, it'd be BGVMIDFA. That would make it more obvious. It would make it more obvious. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was thinking, I, I told uh, Council Member Miller, I would shoot for the name Bob <laughs> by our bonds, but I didn't. So as he said, you could call it anything you would like. Um, so if that, if that would be, you know, I think I think it does help distinguish the two. So that way somebody who's quickly looking at you know, different by t different types of bonds from us would not be confused by which ones were previous bonds and which one are the current bonds. Who was issuing what bonds? And right. Um, and especially when we're dealing with the state. Right. That, that's why uh, 
I thought it would be important to make a clear distinction, uh, and that comes from my service on the oversight panel, where you have these people from all around the county and the county controller, and then we have to send it to the Department of Finance and the State Department uh, of uh, Control and Audits and the controller, and so they get confused. I mean, even really basic things, they didn't quite understand something like, uh, you know, the marina has a parking lot. Uh, I mean, they didn't even get that. So for sure, they would be confused by this. So I thought, let's do our best to make sure that we give them distinctive names so they won't be saying, hey, you're doing something illegal, you know, which right. wouldn't surprise me at all would, would come from Sacramento. Because they, they just don't read that carefully. So that's that's the reason for it. Okay. okay. No other questions? Any other comments? Makes from sense to the name. So do we want to open the public hearing to any members of the public that would like to speak? Seeing no hands, close the public hearing. Pardon? Oh, you have discussion. You can do both. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah. I think we've done that. It makes sense, yeah. And so I would uh, move uh, adoption of the resolution uh, 2014-39 with the change in the name that we've discussed. And and before that, I would like to ask um, the city attorney, the resolution has Quint and Thinning LLP in the left-hand corner on that. This has been reviewed by uh, the city attorney's office and been approved and is not, um, I'm not sure who, I can't tell you quite who Quint and Thinning are. Um, Quint and Thimming is our bond council. Right. Okay. Specifically for who, I mean, but Brian Quint is the city's bond council who specifically helps us through our um, financing to make sure that whatever everything we're doing is legal and that it meets the requirements of the IRS for, you know, thing, make sure things are tax exempt that should be or taxable that should be. Okay. And, and so this has been reviewed by our city attorney. Yeah. For content. For content. Thank you. Um, and so do I have a motion to? I made the motion, so okay. I guess you need a second. I'll Aye. second that. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And that brings us to item C, which is consider adoption of resolution 2014-36, expressing official intent regarding certain expenditures to be reimbursed with proceeds of obligations. Staff report. So this one is we're trying to begin the process of completing our 2013-2014 capital improvement projects that the, for the water and sewer projects that the city council approved last year. Um, we This is where we are going to sell a $5 million bond to pay for these. We've talked about that process in the past. We began that process by mailing out the Proposition 218 letter um, it went out in the mail on the 30th and um, people do have that now you will be reviewing the rate structure back um, in November of 2014 and that is all part of the letter but in order for the staff for staff to begin working on those projects and to be reimbursed for the work that they do you need ha you need to have a, re a reimbursement resolution an intent for to be reimbursed from the bond proceeds so if we were to do work prior to the bond proceeds and you do not pass this type of a resolution, then the bond proceeds cannot be used to reimburse the city for previous expenditures. But once you pass this resolution, the city can be reimbursed for expenditures that it makes for these projects, even before the bonds are sold. So the sooner we can get this passed, the sooner I can tell Randy that it is okay for him to start working on the projects and just to remind people who don't have the staff report in front of them, there are four projects that we're, work, that we're trying to complete. They are the Bayshore Boulevard 8-inch force main underground relocation, the Glen Park pump station upgrade, pressure reducing valve construction and fire main on Annis with a line FGHIJ, and the Annis pressure reducing valve, and then the supervisory control and data acquisition system replacement, or what I call SCADA. So those are the projects that we're looking to complete. Thank you. And this is where we should add the 
whereas in this resolution to say that we had mailed the letter on September 30th to homeowners and to ratepayers. And, and <clears throat> my, uh, Any and questions? My further suggestion was that the letter be Exhibit A. Okay. And the reason for that is that that puts everything together for the record. We will do that. Because the letter gives a lot of information that, that's not in the resolution. Yeah. I do have a question, uh, Madam Pru, Tim. Uh, so, Stuart, can you talk about the um, the reserve that we have in uh, the uh, utility fund? Sure. Um, we've had a couple of good years where people have been have used uh, more water than they had in the past. So, we do have some money available in cash. We have three million dollars available cash in the water and sewer fund. Um, as you know, there is a policy of the city council is to have a minimum of 20 percent of its utility fund in cash reserves for future emergencies. There is also, you know, my concern as we are working through the drought that a number of people are going to begin to reduce their water usage. And the unfortunate part of that is that they re the people who were asking to reduce their water usage is the landscape people which is our high water collections. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had set rates back when, during the recession, when people, there was a less water being used. And then as the recession ended, more people used water, we got more money in. But now that we're looking through the drought, my guess is we're gonna get back towards, you know, more of that recession level of water usage. Mm -hmm. So I'd be concerned about using the money that we have in reserve for anything other than to protect rates moving forward until we're sure of what's going to happen when the drought is over and what the base water usage is going to be. Because, the you know, there's another concern I have with the drought. We are encouraging people to change over their landscaping for, to a more drought-tolerant landscape. So even as we finish through the drought, if people do make the changes that we're requesting, mm -hmm. we will see a reduction in water use going forward. So we will need to, you know, I think having a larger reserve so we're not you know, quote unquote, penalizing people for saving water it would be a good idea of going forward for the near future. Okay. All right. Yeah. And you talked about how um, in the budget finance uh, subcommittee that we would be looking at uh, analyzing is that the appropriate amount and then reporting that back to the, the full council? Right. I mean, there's a number of reserves that we need to start looking at as a city and that is one of those issues that we need to tackle as a city and as a city council and a community. Sure. Corey, do you have any questions? No, no questions. Ray? No. So make a motion to, or we'll open up the public comments. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak? Yeah. Seeing no show of hands, I oh, will. Oh. <laughs> I was awfully quick. I wasn't looking to the back of the room. I, I was trying to be a gentleman and give somebody else a chance. Okay. I got that wonderful letter that Stuart sent out. Can you tell us your name? Tony Varios, 122 Warbler. And my reaction to it is that I, I felt that the rate charges for the zero use and the, very, the zero, one unit, two unit, three unit use were on the high end and that the charges for the very high use should be higher. Now, I, I don't have the statistics that the city has. Maybe Stewart's got uh, statistics from the water department on how many people have reduced what percentage. But I know that we've conserved in our household from the beginning in 2000, and we can't cut it down hardly anymore without being really ridiculous. So. I don't mind paying what we pay. We have to pay for the basic infrastructure. And like Stuart pointed out, as people conserve, then the city gets less revenue. You have to balance this out. I understand that very well. But I don't think some of the business community that are large water users and the large homeowners associations, um, I think they should po probably pay more than what's anticipated at this point. And that would give them even greater incentive to save more and do the conversions that Stuart's talking about. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thank you. Um, 
in response to that, I, I don't think this resolution is um, raising the rates, and we certainly will have a hearing about the raising of the rates at a future council date. Um, so it is something to be aware that as usage goes down, we are all going to be paying more per gallon of water um, because we won't have quite the economy of scale. But I think that the staff will look into that very thoroughly about where the fair balance is with our water usage. Right. Um, you know, I, we are having the meeting. I think it's the third. The third Thursday, I think, is November sixteenth, November twentieth. Hmm? I don't know. It's either the sixteenth or twentieth. I, I think it's the November twentieth. Is the third Thursday of November, which is when you will have the hearing on this. I, you know, I, as you would imagine, I'm beginning to receive telephone calls and emails on this. What what I will do on the for that November 20th is create a list of comments that I have received and I will at that time be able to pre be prepared to respond to all the comments so that way the City Council can have a full understanding of what the community is thinking and how the subcommittee went through the process yeah. to create the schedule that it did. Mm. That'll be all good information to give to the public and, and uh, make available before it comes to us. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on that subcommittee, so um, we may need to meet, you know, once more before November 20th. Um, but I just wanted to respond to Tony that the, the original proposal even was more onerous on the lower users. And it was the council members who said, no, nah, that doesn't seem right for people who have really done a lot to conserve. So the, the Problem is, uh, and this is where you got to see, you, as you mentioned, the full statistics, the number of people in all these categories and how much you generate from, from uh, various levels. And even if you really raise you know, some of those very high end ones, very high, it doesn't get you that much more money because there aren't very many of them. Uh, so that's kind of the, the analysis you have to make. And I think the more of that information we can provide you know, for the public so they can see the basis of the, of the decision and, they can think of a, of a better way to do it that gets us to the same bottom line, uh, that would be great. Because we don't want to penalize the people who have been doing the, the real conservative, uh, conserving, and the, and the subcommittee was very concerned about that. So uh, with that, we'll close the public hearing and council discussion. I think we're ready. So I'll adopt resolution 2014-36 with the uh, whereas that uh, Stuart had recommended. Okay. A second. second. Yeah, second. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So that brings us to new business, which is considering adopting resolution 201440, directing the staff to forward the draft 2015 through 2022 housing element to the California Department of Housing and Community Development to review. Pull out my giant staff report. Hang on. Uh, yes, thank you. Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, I'll try to make this as uh, painless as possible. <laughs> um, the housing element, as I'm sure you're all aware, is one of the mandatory elements of the City's general plan. It's probably the only element that the City is obligated under state law to update on a regular basis. Um, the last cycle we went through was a 2007 to 2014 cycle. The current cycle is um, running from January, or from 2015 to 2022. Yes. Um, and the the deadline for um, for adoption for this next cycle is uh, January 31st of 2015. And again, the, sometimes the question arises as to what are the implications of the city. Um, complying with these state obligations in terms of timing. Um, there's definitely a trend in state law to, to put a little bit more um, motivation for cities to comply in terms of a timing standpoint, thank you, in particular. 
Um, particularly, there are a couple things that are important. Uh, one is um, there's uh, an element of funding eligibility for MTC funding, uh, discretionary funding. One of the uh, requirements for eligibility is to have a certified housing element within the prescribed deadline. Uh, the other, which is really quite punitive, I think, is the fact that if we fail to adopt in a timely manner, then we're obligated to update on a four-year cycle as opposed to an eight-year cycle. So that would be two for the two for the price of one in terms of housing elements in the next eight years if, if we fail to adopt within the, a timely manner. So, so I think those are a couple things to, to consider. You know, the purpose of tonight's meeting is not a hearing to adopt the housing element. Really all we're trying to get is authorization to submit the draft housing element to the state, which again is a required part of the process. They have a statutory requirement to review it in, uh, within 60 days, and get their comments back to us. Uh, that would get us, uh, leave us some time at the end of this process to adopt uh, through January. So again, it's a little bit of an iterative process working with the state in terms of making sure their comments are addressed or working through our comments. Uh, but again, that's something that usually happens in a 30 to 60 day window. So really the purpose of tonight's meeting is, is to ensure that the, um, the document that is submitted to the state uh, does reflect the council's policy direction. Uh, you know, we don't wanna submit something to the state and then the council in consideration of adoption makes significant policy changes because that would again trigger another round of HCD review. So we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to make sure the, the, all the policy issues are addressed adequately and that, that really does reflect the council's direction before we submit it to the state. And again, the, the purpose um, of the housing element is prescribed by state law is to plan for housing needs for all economic segments of the community's population. And that's balanced with land use, environmental and other city goals. Um, most of the issues that the Brisbane has, most cities in the peninsula or in the Bay Area have, is not market rate housing, it's low and moderate income housing. And that tends to drive um, all the sort of decision making in terms of the number of units we need to plan for. It really relates to low and moderate income units, not, not market housing as a rule. It also includes an identification and analysis of existing and projected housing needs as both economically as well as within various needs groups, special needs groups, uh, seniors, uh, large families, et cetera. There's projections included in the housing element as to the, those kind of needs within the community, homeless, uh, very various uh, special needs groups. And the housing element also includes a number of goals, policies, objectives, and implementation programs. And as I think if you've seen the document or looked through it, you'll see that structured uh, throughout the document, implementation uh, programs with specific dates of uh, dates to uh, perform, you know, when certain programs or policies will be implemented by, and you'll see that throughout the document. And probably one of the most, always one of the most difficult issues here in Brisbane is always gonna be the identification of adequate sites for housing is again, a requirement of the document uh, and it's addressed and I'll go into that in some detail. So again, by way of background, again, the previous housing element from 2007, 2014, was adopted in 2011. I know that seems pretty far into the cycle, but uh, that was primarily due to the fact that the state granted a number of extensions uh, to all jurisdictions to, um, to adopt that. You know, that was occurring in the recession uh, primarily, and there was a lot of um, some latitude given for local jurisdictions to, to move forward with adopting the housing element. So actually, although we adopted it in 2011, that was in compliance with the state deadlines at the time. Uh, given that was only a couple of years ago, however, uh, that means the previous housing element was reviewed and certified by the state. And it was a decision in looking at this 2015 to 22 element as more of an update. We didn't want to remake the wheel, you know, reformat the document, restructure it in a completely new way. So really we focused on updating it as needed to reflect, you know, either changes in state law, updated demographic information, et cetera. And some of the, the key updates 
would include update of demographic data, because again, when we prepared the previous element, the 2010 census data wasn't available, so it's been updated to incorporate that information. It also outlines uh, the policies and programs from the last element that we were able to implement over the you know the three-year cycle since the last adoption. It does incorporate a number of changes. If you look at the previous housing element, there was a number of policies and programs that were the obligation of the redevelopment a agency to perform, low mod housing, set aside funds, et cetera. So all those kind of references to uh, redevelopment have been modified or eliminated from the current housing element. And again, lastly, circling back to a recurring theme is the identification of the uh, adequate housing sites. And um, in this particular housing element, we have two components of that. One is to address the carryover from the previous housing element, which we did not uh, accomplish the required rezonings uh, by the, the deadline specified in the previous housing element and then to accommodate our housing uh, need uh, for the next uh, seven year cycle that was established. So again, the shortfall from the, um, the numbers from the last housing element ends up being about 210 units. Our obligation under that, that element was 401 units. So that was our obligation. Uh, we, uh, you know, identified a number of sites that met part of that, and then we also committed to a couple of key rezonings. One was the Southeast Crocker Park mixed use, and another was to rezone uh, what is the South uh, West Bayshore area for residential. Um, and the um, the housing, or when the Planning Commission started moving forward to implement, particularly the Southwest Bayshore. Uh, rezoning. If you start looking at the uh, topographic constraints and access constraints associated with that property that was planned for residential zoning, um, we determined uh, and the commission uh, determined that that would be infeasible. And so actually they went back to the council probably about a year ago and directed or requested the opportunity to look at alternative sites. And that was again an action the council um, concurred with about a year ago. And then in terms of the Southeast Crocker Park mixed use, uh, that did not move forward primarily. Um, I know there's a lot of planning efforts with um, the Crocker Park um, technical assistance panel and kind of getting an idea of what that report would recommend or suggest for that area. Um, it was felt that that would be a good st a starting off point for any kind of rezoning effort in, in Crocker Park. And again, well, that's moved forward. It really hasn't, um, that the TAP report hasn't been presented to the full council yet. So again, that, that effort has sort of been deferred until such time as the TAP report is, is presented and the council chooses to act on some of the recommendations. So I think it would have some impact on how the, the subsequent rezonings occur. So again, that was the shortfall, the 210 units. And then the new requirements for our next RENA cycle, or RENA, which is our regional housing needs allocation, I'll use that terminology throughout, um, is 83 units for this next upcoming cycle. So uh, I think that was a very um, appropriate adjustment. The 401 unit allocation for the previous cycle was really, um, you know, in the city's opinion, was really unrealistic and quite severe. And I think the 83 units is really a number that's a lot more uh, realistic given Brisbane's size and capacity to, to develop. So, so I think the number really does recommend a, a proper adjustment uh, from the region. Again, this table isn't that useful, but it does show the carryovers and the new uh, RENA numbers for the, the current cycle. I think that really what you want to take from this primarily is that the shortfall, as you see, is coming primarily in the very low, low and moderate income categories. You know, of our, of the, of the, of the shortfall, that's 263 of the 293 units comes in those categories. So, so when I say that our planning is really oriented toward accomplishing or accommodating the very low, low and moderate, I think that kind of gives you an idea of the scale issues we're talking about. 
And again, when we're talking about those sort of categories of income, the state has some very specific criteria for what they consider a qualifying site to, to qualify as low or moderate income. And these are some of the criteria that are established by the state. Do you have to establish a minimum density of 20 units to the acre? You need to have a minimum site area that would allow for a project of 16 units or more that at least half of the low mod units be provided in residentially zoned sites, not within a mixed use um, project. So again, that's another constraint. And that the zone sites um, have to allow the densities and the development by right and not subject to use permit, plan development permit or, or other discretionary design review that might impact density or reduce density. So, so those are Again, state requirements that we're um, we need to sort of operate within as we as we move forward with our zoning. So, looking at those parameters, the the planning commission went through a fairly extensive process of of reviewing the housing element overall. Uh, over you know, I think it was about eight workshops over six months or so, maybe a little over that earlier this year, and a fair amount of the time was spent on on this sort of issue of what the adequate sites would be. And in this graphic, I'm trying to demonstrate where the, where the current residential zoning is in town, um, where the, the planning commission considered alternative sites they considered that you might able to accommodate our additional housing needs. And those are areas shown in blue. You know, the, the three that were primarily looked at were um, you know, there's some discussion about Sierra Point and then the VWR site. Those were dismissed fairly readily uh, out of hand because there are a number of constraints and uh, policy decisions that would, would make residential um, maybe inconsistent. So those were dismissed pretty easily. I think the one that was probably had the most traction or the most discussion was the idea of in the in the proximity of the village in Southeast Crocker where um, the, the required units could be accomplished or best accommodated. And ultimately, it was the commission's recommendation that they be accommodated in two discrete spots. Uh, and that would be the two properties on Park Place in a mixed use format and then residential only on these three properties on Park Lane. And by designating those at the densities which are specified, um, the mixed use at 20 to the acre and the um, residential at 26 to the acre, uh, we can basically accommodate our shortfall on those particular properties. Um, and I think it's important to understand what the context of the housing element is relative to other planning that might occur that involves other properties such as the village or the post office or the 125 valley property which were you know previously considered for mixed use um, the the by by meeting the housing element obligations on these particular parcels what that does is provide a little more flexibility for the city or planning of these other remaining parcels because again if it's the city's determination that that's going to be more of a mixed use district or portions of it are going to be mixed use and they're parcels that aren't specifically designated to meet our housing element requirements then those state adopted criteria don't necessarily apply we don't have to have the minimum density we don't have to have some of these other criteria so we really felt it would give the city a little more flexibility in, in planning this whole area um, over time. And should those planning efforts not, not ultimately um, result in any future activity, then we'd still be in a position where we could discreetly rezone these properties in the manner prescribed by state law, allow for their, what we consider a very logical development pattern and meet our state obligations. So it both accommodates maybe a larger area planning approach, but it also allows us to meet our needs, um, you know, on a standalone basis if that's ultimately the, the, the larger planning decision the city makes. 
Uh, there are a no number of other sort of policy and program changes that were proposed as part of the housing element. A couple relate to that new overlay zoning that's being uh, created. Uh, you know, the, the Planning Commission spent a lot of time with the, the concern that uh, that introducing residential uses into the industrial park not impinge on or otherwise start to uh, detract from the economic viability of the remaining um, industrial properties within the park. And you know, you can see the, the possibility of that kind of erosion if you introduce residential and, and you get into nuisance issues because a new residential now interfaces with industrial. You know, the concern is that over time, the industrial sort of land uses and um, ability to, to use the land as now planned and zoned would be compromised. So, so again, the, the commission recognized there needs to be a balance between creating a, a really appropriate um, residential environment on those parcels while still protecting the, uh, the remaining industrial base within Crocker Park. And there's policy language that was introduced specifically to make sure that that kind of uh, trade-off and balance issue is, is addressed in, in any subsequent rezonings for the site to create these overlay zones. And also that the, you know, you would take a look, the city would take a look at the the Crocker Park, <coughs> excuse me, zoning um, development standards to again try to promote compatibility. So, I mean, those would be all efforts of zoning that would be um, implementation measures following adoption of this housing element. We're not trying to determine what all those issues would be at this particular juncture in adopting the housing element. Those are implementation steps. Secondly, there was an issue of um, the, the, the 2007 housing element relied very heavily on form-based code as a vehicle to um, allow for by right zoning or to allow residential uses by right in this area while still providing a lot of proactive city um, direction as to the form of the development, its style, its physical character, other amenities. Um, and uh, form-based zoning is one tool that's possible to do that, but it's not the only tool. And so what the Planning Commission did was um, eliminate the specification of form-based coding as the tool to achieve the city's zoning, because we believe there are other tools that might be appropriate. And I think the, the real goal is to is still to, um, for the city to provide a very proactive vision for how these properties are to be developed and their form and their um, um, amenities and other aspects. Uh, so a developer understands what those requirements are up front and the city's not in reactive mode of having to react to a developer's proposal. And so again, it's trying to make sure that is still captured, but without tying us to a particular tool, which may or may not be the best tool for the, for the area. Uh, some other policy and program changes. One relates to secondary dwelling units, in which, um, again, there's a, there's quite a gap between what's theoretically possible in terms of units in town that might accommodate a secondary dwelling unit versus our production historically. And the state typically only gives you credit for numbers that are more along your historic production. Uh, they're, they're not gonna give us credit for a theoretical number of secondary dwelling units that might be um, created if we have a you know a history over the last 10 or 12 years of a number that's much lower. And so some of these policies that are discussed in here are really intended to try to maybe stimulate or allow for a little higher production of secondary dwelling units uh, where appropriate and suitable, um, including reducing the, uh, the fees for units that occur strictly within a building envelope because they tend to be a much more simpler review explore the possibility for you know, loan programs potentially to allow for those or to promote them. Working with the Ridge to see uh, amending the Northeast Ridge permit to allow uh, the conversion of existing floor area to secondary dwelling units. And then it's lastly exploring the reduction in lot size minimum for secondary dwelling units on lots. So those are all just again, policy suggestions that would be vetted fully you know, through the implementation program and the city may choose to do any or none of these uh, as an implementation step, but they're doing suggestions at this particular point in time. 
a couple other um, components <clears throat> that were uh, considered and are proposed in the housing element. Uh, one is the consideration of adopting a um, housing impact fee or commercial linkage fee. And the basic premise there is that the production of market rate housing or um, additional non-residential space create a demand for service sector uh, jobs and services that, that basically create a demand for low and moderate income housing. You know, if you're going to need service sector jobs that don't pay, um, you know, they pay at a low moderate level, you know, that, that's really the, the, the thought process behind the, the, both of those uh, fees. And the city would collect that and then be able to put that toward, um, toward um, development of low mod housing. So again, that's partially an attempt to offset the loss of redevelopment funding for low and moderate income housing. A similar vein, um, there are several housing um, uh, advocacy groups that are requested in all the jurisdictions within the county to to um, devote a portion of the property taxes, additional property tax the city received through the elimination of redevelopment and, and dedicate those specifically for low mod income housing. Again, that would be a policy decision for the council at some point, uh, often referred to as boomerang funds. And so there was mention made in the housing element for this, the city may want to consider that as well. And then lastly, the city does have inclusionary requirements today, which means that a Residential projects of a certain size have an obligation to um, to include a certain percentage of low and moderate income units. Uh, there have been some changes in state law and state laws interpreted through litigation, uh, such that our inclusionary requirements and ordinance need to be amended. So again, one of the implementation steps is to amend our our um, inclusionary housing requirements to comply with state law. Um, again. The staff recommendation is to adopt the resolution and authorize staff to submit the draft housing element to the HCD for review and um, consideration. Come back to the city council following that uh, that review. Uh, with that said, I'm open the uh, the floor to questions. Would point out uh, preparation of this housing element was a really a, a team effort in the planning department. I have um, retired planner Toon back for a special uh, visit today and. Uh, Senior Planner Johnson, who are instrumental in preparing this document, and all three of us will be available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Do we have any uh, questions for staff, Lori? Sure. Um, okay. Thank you for the report. That was really informative and helpful. Um, and I learned a lot reviewing my first housing element <laughs> draft. Um, and one of the things which I just wanted to emphasize that I, I hadn't realized, maybe it's a misconception among the public as well, that it's not the actual units being built that is what matters. It's the, the zoning is how it, the numbers get met. Um, and so if they get zoned for residential, it gets counted and then that if, if it doesn't get zoned, but not, not that it doesn't get built, but it doesn't get zoned to a certain number of properties, then that amount gets carried over. So I thought that was a, an important distinction to know. Um, so I had a question about the, the secondary dwelling units. I, you know, I understand how that'll increase um, the amount of affordable units, but how does that get tracked? Are there permits that are required to open up those types of units in existing homes, and how does that affect the arena numbers? Yes, there are permits required through the city. There are also development standards for, you know, in terms of parking and other amenities that need to be provided with secondary dwelling units. So that is a planning permit people okay. apply for. Um, and we can track those. And again, if, if there's more production of those units, and then historically, for example, over the period of this housing element cycle, then we could make the case um, at the next housing element cycle that that a higher proportion of our of our housing need could theoretically be met by this particular because right now there's a gap between what's you know the number of lots in town that could theoretically accommodate a secondary dwelling unit 
versus the production of those units. And the production is very small relative to the number of units that are theoretically capable of accommodating them. And the state doesn't give us credit for our theoretical yield. They give us credit for what they consider reasonably foreseeable and they use past trends as a predictor of future performance. So. Okay, but the state gives credit only for zoning changes, and there's no zoning change, is there, when when a secondary dwell dwelling unit gets created? There's no zoning change, but the zoning, a zoning allows for secondary dwelling units. So that's fundamentally our zoning allows for secondary units under certain criteria. And, uh, but it is the one area where they don't give us credit on a theoretical basis for secondary units. It's, it's right, a it would have to be that when, when they come and say, you know, here's how many units we think we're going to require, we would then say, well, we already did create so many through these secondary dwelling units, and it would sort of be a responsive argument is what you're saying. And then we would say for the next time, well, we, we produced picking them we pick we produced 30 over the last housing element cycle we think that trend will continue and we would suggest that 30 to 50 would be met in the next cycle so I mean it's predictive too because part of what we're doing is is trying to accommodate for an upcoming cycle but if we're only producing three to five units a year or three to five over the life of the housing element and to say well we're gonna we think we're gonna produce 70 secondary dwelling units in the next 10 years or five years you know, they'll look at past performance as not being uh, predictive and they wouldn't give us credit for our claim. So again, that would just push our demand for required sites elsewhere. So that, that's kind of the, the trade-off. Okay. And so th there was this drop now, you know, from down from 400-something to, to 83 for the this next cycle. So. Can you talk about how that happened? You know, what, what were the, was there a higher figure originally suggested and how did we get it down to 83? Again, the RENA, for, for those who haven't been involved in this process, is a number that's imposed on the city by, through a regional process. It's not a number the city necessarily has. We certainly have no final say over it. We try to, you know, tug it in the right direction through the regional process, but we really don't have a final say on it. The 2007 number, I think, was based on a different methodology than the, than the current cycle. The, the 2007 methodology was weighted really heavily toward jobs housing balance in a town or in the community, and Brisbane was perceived as being jobs rich and housing poor, and so we took what I consider a disproportionately high number of housing units to in, in the regional perspective <coughs> that was to balance out our jobs housing imbalance you know whether, whether or not that's a valid argument or a valid approach you know I, I don't I, I don't think it is but you know it's water under the bridge that was our number uh, for this current cycle they were orienting development toward PDAs priority development areas locations with transit etc cetera, etc cetera. and so Areas like Brisbane that didn't really have that sort of features were really <laughs> left with a very a relatively flat, you know, there was, everyone had kind of a baseline growth rate, and that's what we took. And jurisdictions that had PDAs and opportunities for transit-oriented growth um, took a higher number. Okay, and did the fact that we had um, some unmet figure, did that factor in at all to the lower number that we weren't able to fulfill those numbers? For the last cycle does that play into it no it really doesn't um, because i think in fact that's why the requirement is for the carryover i don't think they want to create a yeah they don't want to create that an incentive a disincentive for for jurisdictions to perform say we just sort of wipe the slate clean and then we can just forget about those 400 and deal with the 80. that would have been you know a little easier for us okay. personally but um, that's not what the state is you know, they want us to carry that burden forward and, and still meet that previous burden. They're not, they're not claiming that that number was bad. You know, the, that number is the number they assigned us, and, and you know, in their mind, we have to live with that number and, and meet it. And there, there is, you know, if we are on our, if we are unable to meet the, the number as we, as we weren't in the last cycle, then there, there is no penalty. It's just sort of a, an aspirational goal. <laughs> That starts to get, I mean, there's already a penalty in a way of the process that we're going through with our housing element. 
there's even a much more simplified way of doing this if we had met all our housing numbers okay you know we'd be talking about a very streamlined hcd review and a much more simplified process so in a sense we are paying the city through our administrative process is paying the price uh, and and i think down the road i think it's going to be a little more this is always evolving in the idea that the state in the last tying housing to transportation to sustainability community strategy you know their direction in the future is going to be on housing production as well so you know I, I only foresee the obligations on the city you know through housing elements and other sort of uh, requirements to perform only getting more rigorous over time frankly mm -hmm. that's that's my mm -hmm. okay um and you talked about it in your presentation, but one of the questions I had um, asked staff about was, you know, why we hadn't considered the other properties like the post office and um, the other, the Valley Drive property next next to the shopping center. And, you know, as it was explained by staff, and, you know, it doesn't mean we can't zone those for residential, but it, it just constrains us more if we put them in the housing element because then we have to get all, meet all the housing element requirements. So. Thought that was that was good good information to know. Um, let's see. <coughs> and so, so which uh, that's an interesting question. I think we need a little more. At least I need a little bit more clarification on what you just said, which I, everything okay. you got from staff. So okay, I would appreciate a little bit more elaboration on what uh, Councilmember Liu just said. Yeah, I think there are, well, and maybe uh, I might have s some assistance from my colleagues because part of this is a numeric exercise. We have to achieve a certain number of units, right? So there are a couple of variables. You know, the area from all the discussion we had with the Planning Commission, the area in question was pretty clear. You know, that southeast Crocker was the preferred location. So it got back down to how many parcels would you need to designate what density would you apply to them and um, how you which configuration so which parcels and at what density and what the numbers would end up being so we looked at I think a number of different iterations about if you zoned Valley Drive for example you know the 125 Valley right next to the shopping center you, know, you could achieve a lot of the same numbers um, actually more numbers than than the housing element would require um, but then again, if you just did all the Valley Drive and Park Place properties, you'd have to designate some of those just for residential, and you wouldn't be able to have mixed use. So it got to be a very complicated little pattern of of um, parcel the the parcels. And do you really want to constrain yourself to say that 125 Valley would be mixed use at 20 units to the acre? but the parcel next door would be residential only at 24 to the acre. It created, a, I think, a very unnecessarily um, complicated and, and confining sort of set of regulations for the city to kind of go through this planning process for this, this larger you know, edge condition. So what we tried to do is create what we considered very logical units that would meet our needs that would fit within a larger uh, context of what the city might want to do with, with the you know the village and the adjacent properties and whatever for future planning so it's really kind of a judgment call and, and the fact of the matter is the more you designate you, you 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 impose those density requirements in particular you really eliminate your flexibility of, of maybe you know a lower density makes sense in certain areas but by putting uh, the housing element restriction then we're then we do have the minimum density uh, and we didn't really think that was necessarily uh, the best thing to do and if you want to go through really site specific numbers we can do that you know as, a, as an exercise for you but that, that's kind of the picture we're trying to not over-regulate all these parcels because I think really what I look at this or what we look at this is the housing element shouldn't necessarily drive the city's planning for that area and the future of the village and those adjacent you know that edge condition it's something that needs to be addressed and need to be incorporated 
but I don't know that you want to let the housing element requirements drive every planning decision that's made out there. Yeah, that seems to make sense to me because, you know, say, you know, the 125 Valley Drive, what if we decide that we don't want housing there at all and we just want to expand the commercial and, you know, have that front bay shore and, you know, really make a more robust shopping center by expanding into there and have our residential next to it. Um, that would constrain us if we said that there had to be some form of housing there. So, um, and then with the post office uh, site, I had asked the same question and the response was that, sure, we can have residential there, but it's not necessary. You know, when we kind of want to do the minimum of what is necessary to put into the housing element so that we're not, um, you know, bound by the density requirements and whatever requirements there are. So, um, and on secondary dwelling units, going back to that again. So right now I, I had asked what the minimum lot size was and the response that I got was that it's 5,000 feet. And the proposal in here is that we eliminate that completely. And can you talk, um, John, a little about, you know, why is, might I make it zero? I have to look. I thought the wording was reduce or eliminate, but I... Or is it reduce? Wrong. Maybe I'm... You know, the idea was if someone had, you know, I think this was in response to a, a resident who came up, and I don't know if their lot was 4,800 square feet or something, and their, their question was, well, if I can meet all the development standards for a secondary unit, which there are for parking and size and all these other things, why shouldn't I be eligible to establish a secondary unit on my property? And so, you know, the commission thought it was worth investigating, you know, as part of a, as a policy or a program, you know, as an implementation step. But they could probably only do that if the acreage was pretty close. That's, that's true because again, you, the, with the development standards, you know, they still have to comply with the development standards for a secondary unit, so. So, I mean, reduce, maybe, maybe eliminate, you know, if you're probably isn't a, a needed, I don't think we'd ever eliminate the standard. You know, you may reduce the, the minimum lot size for that. Okay. But there's still requirements for, you know, say <coughs> bed, size of bedrooms or other structures. Sizes and parking, parking being the, the right. primary driver. That's something that we're going to still be looking at <coughs> in the process of looking at that. To, to piggyback on that, currently if someone has let's say a 4,800 square foot lot, and so doesn't meet the minimum 5,000, they can still apply to the Planning Commission to um, have a secondary unit through exemption or through a var variance, is that correct? Um, that is actually not a variance item. You can't, it's not a development standard, it's a density question. So you cannot get a variance to that minimum lot size requirement. Okay. And, um, okay. Thank you. And these um, housing impact fees, would those only be applied to new development and would they include secondary dwelling units? Or just new construction. We wouldn't. We'd only apply it to market rate, yeah. new new residential construction. Okay. Secondary so that would units be are a developer that that pays that that fee. Or if someone you know had an infill lot and wanted to build a single family residence, yes, sure. that would be. Okay. Um. Okay. And then with the um, affordable housing overlay, you mentioned that um, the Planning Commission recommended in including some language in the policy about having a balance um, based on some concerns raised by the property owners, the commercial property owners about balancing the, you know, the viability of the commercial businesses with the residential being right, right next door. Can you talk about what kinds of things would be done to 
make sure that those types of uses could coexist. Um, you know, for instance, you know, traffic issues, no, uh, noise, um, carbon emissions. I think a couple things. One is, you know, the park lane uh, corridor is certainly not subject to the same kind of traffic volumes and heavy truck volumes that Valley is. So you know, we, we think they'll actually be, well, they'll be reduced from it would be on Valley or Bay Shore certainly. So that area is a little less impacted. But um, even then the BAQMD as part of their last um, CEQA guidelines update, you know, part of this whole trend toward TOD development, which tends to involve uh, multifamily along some fairly um, heavily congested corridors, but they carry a lot of truck traffic and vehicular traffic. They've come up with a number of sort of methods to to minimize the impacts of, uh, or increase the compatibility, I guess, between residential and these kind of uh, emission and noise producers, uh, things like certain kind of ventilation system, exhaust systems, even site design, how you do screening. So private areas, you know, private open spaces are not exposed to, you know, the street and truck traffic. Um, they actually recommend certain types of vegetation that have a sort of a partic uh, particulate cleansing uh, sort of characteristics. So there are a number of, of methodologies that BAQMD recommends. and. I would okay. suspect that as a part of that overlay, we would want to sort of go through that palette and that menu and, and try to incorporate what we think makes sense for, for that residential zone. And then the other part would be to look at um, the, the standards for Crocker and, you know, are there certain activities that, that we feel need to be looked at more closely in proximity to residential. So that would be the other side of the equation. The balance is also to try to make sure that the new or the current industrial is a good neighbor to a future residential. That's the other side. Okay. Thank you. I mean, here, I guess the difference is that we're, you know, there's already existing commercial businesses and we're thinking about putting residential into it. So it's, it's not just starting from scratch where, you know, there's some mixed use developments that have residential and, you know, the top, you know, couple floors and then a business down below. So, you know, I, it sounds very interesting how you're, you know, we'll have to come to that in the future about how to adapt both uses. Um, and then I did have some minor edits, like just typographical things, which I sent on to staff. So I'm hoping those will be incorporated. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Greg, do you have any questions for staff? So this is not a public hearing officially, right? So I just wanted to make one statement that doesn't quite fit in the normal order of things. Um, I just happen to think that this state micromanaging of this area is totally dysfunctional. I'd be willing to bet that over the entire state, um, particularly for cities under 20,000, it doesn't create any affordable housing for low-income people at all. It's just a whole lot of paperwork, busyness, and keep the staff occupied when they ought to be doing other things. Um, There's so many other things that need to be done because, you know, what people don't have is income, and we don't really have uh, builders who are going to build those things. So all these kind of policies are not going to create a hill of beans. So I just think it's a, a huge waste of time for all of us, but we are forced into it by the state who's not willing to live up to its responsibilities. Sorry, I just had to get that off my chest. <laughs> um, I was looking through all this stuff and said, oh, God, you know, none of this is going to work, you know? I mean, it's crazy. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> I had a couple of uh, questions um, that I just wanted to ask our staff. I was looking at page 5-2. Uh, what is 163 Visitation Avenue? Isn't that the L.T. Clark property? That's the old five-star cafe that okay, the city owns. Okay, that's L.T. Clark to me, yeah. Okay. Anyway, it says here that these properties are now owned by the Brisbane Housing Authority, which I think is out of date. Uh, I think that property is now owned by the city. Am I right about that? 
my understanding was that the redevelopment properties were turned over to the housing yes, authority. Yes, but, but then we we came up to the 10-year limit. Uh, we we could keep it in that category, and so the only thing we could do was for the city to buy it. So the city actually owns that property now. Uh, I'll correct that. Thank you. Um, then in the, this whole sec next section on density bonds, um, you know, I haven't heard really much about this, and we're talking about adopting some kind of amendment that we haven't really had a policy discussion about. So I was wondering if you'd address what this is all about. What page is that on? This is 5-2. Uh, uh, the city is required to adopt a density bonus ordinance in compliance with state law, and we did that on the previous housing um, element cycle. Uh, state law then also allows the city to go beyond the minimum state requirements <coughs> to either allow a greater bonus for projects that propose to provide more affordable housing than the minimum required by the state, and you can also go the other direction and allow density bonuses for projects that provide less than the minimum required by the state um, as long as those bonuses are you know, more than what the state would allow for something that's actually meeting its requirements. So um, the particular program that's proposed in this housing element was actually also proposed in the previous one, but we didn't get that far with implementation. Uh, it would allow the city to consider those greater options than what's required under state law to encourage affordable housing beyond the minimum requirements of state. So we really haven't had a discussion about you know, what that would be and what the implications would be and uh, lots and so forth. We have, got, we have not gone into detail. We've had the discussions about the concept right. um, with the previous housing element, right. um, but we, we haven't actually gone to the level of proposing specific numbers. Okay. So again, this is kind of, you know, hey, we might consider this kind of thing and you're going to give us credit for it. It's kind of a check. Okay. Um, I have a question on um, I guess this is uh, 6 11 policy HB 9 this has to do with uh, something you mentioned I think too uh, Mr. Sawicki about um, basically uh, tax increment being put into affordable housing and so uh, the, the one of the, a lot of the things that are in here bother me because they but despite what you said about we shouldn't let the housing element determine our planning I, I think there there is a, a great danger that it will anyway uh, and, and one of the things that we're looking at on the Baylands is how in the world to you know with no redevelopment anymore, how are we going to finance all the infrastructure? Uh, and if we put it all into low and moderate housing, which would be wonderful, then there's no way we're going to finance the infrastructure, and then there's not going to be no development to get the tax income and out of. So the whole thing doesn't make any sense to me. So what do you think? Well, as you're right, I mean, the, the housing element includes a number of what are sort of higher order policy either they can be suggestions recommendations but ultimately these kind of decisions lie to the city council and you know the the problem this housing element recognizes is that there was a dedicated funding source for low and mod housing that has been eliminated so you know we certainly concur that you know whether or not this should be the city's obligation or not is probably a whole nother story but you know, part of what we're trying to demonstrate to the state in this document and what we present to them is that the city is doing its best to try to backfill and, and financially support um, uh, low and moderate income housing. And, and, and so we've identified a couple measures that would provide some alternative funding. Um, you know, again, if, if that's something you're not comfortable with recommending, you should strike it at this point and you don't want to include it as a proposed policy that's that's your dis that's at your discretion um, if you want to leave it in here and at some point it comes forward to you and you decide not to actually 
do such a thing, that's your discretion at that point. Because all it says is consider doing these things. Nothing in this element would ever bind you to, to uh, especially these kind of programs and policies that don't have a state. You know, certain things like the sites, yes, there's a state obligation to rezone. But these kind of policies are ultimately your call. Okay. Um, one more of these uh, kind of mid-level policy things, and that's the, this is on 619, um, and I have a question. This has to deal with the program. It says work with responsible agencies to protect identified environmentally sensitive areas, including but not limited to wetlands, riparian habitat, critical wildlife habitat, geologically hazardous areas areas subject to flooding, visually prominent or sensitive areas, and electric transmission line corridors. My question is, um, why is there no reference to toxic contaminated land? two housing elements ago if you want to add toxic contaminated land that's again your your prerogative I mean that seems like a pretty big issue for Brisbane and not to even have it referenced uh, maybe this isn't the appropriate place for it but it seems to me it ought to be someplace I didn't find it anywhere as a, as a thing to take into consideration I, I don't want to use a broad brush here um, but I think to keep in mind that in previous housing elements, we wanted to make it clear to the state that there was no intention for housing to go on the bay lands. So that might have been one of the reasons why we didn't consider adding it to the list was that no one is planning on housing on the bay lands. There are other areas of toxic contamination right. in Crocker Park. Only place. Yeah. Um, but I believe that those are generally mitigatable um, to accommodate housing. Um, so that might have than the explanation as to why it wasn't thought of previously. But certainly you could add it. Mm -hmm. There's no problem with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so those are the kind of the questions that sort of popped in mind uh, as I was reading through, which are kind of the mid-level questions. Uh, I have a number of higher level policy concerns that uh, I think we should wait until everyone asks their questions and members of the public have their say, and then I'll come back to those if I may. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you, John. Um, so Tim, you, you touched upon this, and so um, so back in I thought it was 2010, but I guess it was 2011. The council adopted the 2007 through 14 uh, arena housing uh, allocation, and we had proposed some sites, and I was just proposing some of the sites um, across the street and then down on on Bayshore. And then what we have for, uh, in front of us tonight is kind of the same situation where we're. Uh, identifying where we could uh, build these units and we're proposing that in these areas in, in the industrial park uh, where we could accommodate that but that's all that we're doing we're, we're saying that okay we can meet your numbers and here's where we're proposing putting the units and and that just or that um, uh, that covers what the state requirements uh, that are that they're asking from us, correct? All right. Okay. And then um, let's see on page three. Okay, you guys talked about the the minimum density for the twenty units uh, per acre, and so that qualifies for being affordable. Now. It's it, the state is saying that's affordable because of the size. Those units don't have any restrictions in regards to what the cost would be. Those would, they would be market rate, but because they're they would be smaller, they would then 
technically or in theory become affordable. That, that is correct, okay. Um, and then also on page three, so you talked about the at least 50% of the lower income housing needs to be just residential. And um, so because of that requirement, that then brought in the reason to look at the other um, uh, sites along park to be residential. Okay, and then so um, we've, we've purchased some sites using the former RDA affordable housing money. So the Lau property and the Five Star Cafe now the, the Five Star Cafe site, of course, is, is owned by the city, not, not by um, uh, the housing, uh, affordable housing authority, but the Lau property is. So where, where, do, where do those particular properties come into the mix in, in regards to our allocation? If you look at table 35, uh, which was uh, the second to the last page of your packet, I believe. Okay. Um, of the staff report? Yes, yes, sorry, the staff report. Uh, there's a section which shows the current zoning. Um, and there's a section uh, in yellow called current zoning totals. And there's a unit total of 161. Okay. Has anybody found that? This table, you said table 35? Yeah. Page four. Okay. The yellow highlighted. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So right above that, that total of 161, there's 21 units identified for RBA Brisbane Housing Authority site. That would be the Lau property. Okay. And then I believe the, the five star were captured up in NCRO 2 up above in that table, four units. They just weren't identified as housing authority sites, which sounds like that would have been inaccurate anyway, so. Okay, so that's where those uh, those units are being shown. All right, thanks. Um, uh, clarification on that. You said it's where it says the um, Brisbane Housing Authority site. That's where it says 21, 161 is the total, correct? correct? Yes. So the the Lau property is 21 units. Correct. Thank you. Okay, cool. And then on, um, on page seven, <coughs> in regards to, um, you know, waiving the administrative costs for the second, um, second uh, secondary uh, dwelling units, what, what kind of um, costs approximately are, are, are we looking at as far as waiving? Uh, staff tells me that's a fee that runs about five to $700. So, you know, I wouldn't think we'd ever eliminate it because there's always gonna be some cost of time, but you know, maybe we could reduce it by 50% if it's a, something that's a much simpler uh, any level of analysis required. And uh, so we'd be looking at something of that order. But again, that would have to be subject to, again, separate city approval as part of our fee ordinance, so. Okay. And then um, going back to page three, <laughs> uh, the last bullet point where the sites must be zoned to permit owner occupied and rental multifamily residential use by right. And so, um, you know, that by right thing is, you know, is scary, right? Because then you're saying that, uh, okay, you, you, you're, you have to have these units and okay, if you want to get the minimum density, you're giving up some rights. And so, Later on in the staff report, you talk about um, the overlay zoning implementation. So, um, you know, we've talked about the form-based codes in the past. Um, you have some, some other versions here, like precise plans or 
uh, maybe a blend of form-based codes and precise plans. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that can provide some assurance for the community that if something is built, it's built more in uh, you know being compatible with the rest of the community? Yeah, the precise plan is, um, you look at it almost like a tool that can be um, like, um, it can have the same sort of breadth of coverage as a specific plan. You get to the point of, you know, de determining setbacks, determining building heights, determining building form, building pattern, you know, do you want buildings with up to the street or do you want them set back, do you want the parking behind buildings? All those can be specified as design components of a precise plan. And sometimes they're just a little easier to both explain and graphically illustrate in that form as opposed to a, a zoning code book. So I mean that's part of it just becomes a matter of what is the what is the right tool. I mean the idea that the city needs to create the vision and the lay out what the form of those future developments need to be is absolutely the case. So it's just a matter of what is the right tool to do that. Um, precise plans work well when you have a discrete numbers of properties that are being addressed. And so that's, you know, a, a tool that seems like it could be quite effective in this area. But again, if this housing element gets adopted in this form, then, you know, we really have to roll up our sleeves and, and figure out the implementation steps. Okay. So um, with that, there are these safeguards that we could put in place, um, still allowing the, uh, the minimum density to occur um, so that the, you know, the right thing that, that's mentioned here by right is, is not necessarily so. There, there are some tools at our disposal where we can um, determine how things will appear once they are built. Yeah, I think the by right relates to the the density because you can't yeah. you can't say well as part of a design permit, well, it's too crowded so we're going to reduce your yield by 6 units. You know, that's it's going to be this is the form it's going to take. The, you know, the minimum density is what's going to be kind of the the un that's the part that the property owner is going to have to be able to rely upon. And John, can you talk about um, the statewide litigation as it relates to the inclusionary housing ordinances that, that we have passed and a lot of cities have passed? And so w w what's up with that? There was a, and I don't know if the city attorney wants to weigh in on this, it's called the Palmer decision. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the short answer is that it cast a doubt whether the city could impose inclusionary requirements of <coughs> rental properties and rental projects where there's not a city sort of contribution or financial stake or financial interest in the project. That's kind of the short answer. Thank you. So the Palmer decision impacts um, part of the zoning ordinance and that's a piece that will get amended to, to um, be consistent with the general plan later on. Mm -hmm. And there is a piece of the current zoning ordinance that the Palmer decision says is no longer enforceable as it currently stands. And it's sitting on the books as it sits on the books in many, many other cities across the state. Um, but it currently is not enforceable um, if there were a current development project going on. But um, it, it doesn't do any harm sitting on the books um, there are ways it could become enforceable, but they would be some hoops that the city would have to go through. And so those can be issues that the city looks at going forward. Um, it is my understanding from planning staff that the county is doing a study and there is a possibility that study could support the ordinance the way we have it, depending on how that study is done. Um, and we would have to take a look at that. So um, the Palmer decision impacts the enforceability of a piece of the zoning ordinance um, and could impact how the state would look at um, the zoning requirements in order to meet um, the qualifications that we're currently addressing. Um, but 
it doesn't directly impact what you're doing here other than how the state might count the dwellings to determine whether you've met your figures. Sure. Okay. So then just to kind of make it simple, if there was, say, one San Bruno, so if that project was before the Planning Commission right now and they wanted to build their 15 units, um, based on that decision, we, is, we, they, we, they still would be required to build the affordable housing units? My understanding is that the Palmer decision only impacted rental units. Yes. So okay. And San Bruno, for example, was a for sale. Okay. So that, that is correct. Palmer talks about the, the um, what it doesn't allow is to put a condition on building um, the low income in with rental units. It rental doesn't units affect um, a building that is um, based on ownership. Um, and again, that's sort of a general rule. There are some exceptions. Um, if the city is kicking some money in and, and there's a contract with the developer, you can get around Palmer. Um, and there are some other ways, but the general rule is you can, Palmer changed the way that muni municipalities can act in, with regard to properties that are being developed for as rentals. Rental. Um, but not that are straight up ownership. Okay. Is that a Supreme Court decision or lower level? You know, the Palmer decision is, um, I think it's a California Supreme Court decision, but it I can double check It is a Supreme Court it. decision. I believe it is, okay. yes. Yeah, and, you know, and, that, and so that, I guess, uh, you know, another question I have is, you know, how, you know, what steps can we take t to ensure that, you know, some of the units that are going to be affordable are for rent rather than, than just for ownership? As, as a policy matter, I think John can probably address that better. Y um, yeah, I mean, uh, okay. <laughs> John, sorry, Teresa, <laughs> looking at you. Well, there's really nothing, I mean, in our zoning regulations that require rental, um, new projects to be rental. I mean, the only thing we, we are able to regulate is conversion, you know, to make sure that our existing rental stock is preserved. But in terms of uh, future projects, um, no, there's no specific zoning requirements that something be uh, for rent only. Um, you know, certainly when you had a redevelopment agency and the city was financially contributing to projects, you know, that ability to sort of shape and fund certain product types, you had a lot more flexibility with that. So in terms of a private development that's not, you know, requiring any public subsidy or any public contribution, it's, it's, it's a very difficult, and I'm not aware of any planning or legal sort of mechanism where the city could require that. Right. Okay. All right, thank you. So I have just a couple questions that are for staff. I have quite a few personal opinions, but we'll save those for the next phase. Um, so John, you said that we have a, an, an average of 60 days um, that the state has to review this document to bring it back to say whether they feel it's adequate and uh, meets their specifications. And, and the, if we were to approve this tonight, the 60 days would put us to the mid-December. Mid and what day is this report due? What's the drop date on this? being submitted to the state as complete and approved? The, the criteria, the deadline is adoption by the city, not anything going back to the state. So we've been talking about having it adopted by January 31st of next year. That's the deadline. And the 60 days is actually a maximum statutory. By, by statute, the state has a maximum of 60 days to review and re respond back to us, not, okay. not an average. So. And you said for the last um, housing element sees uh, period that it was we were still within um, our extensions because the state had changed that date by several years. Um, are we expecting that date to be ex extended during this 
season or or um, period? Or I've heard I've heard nothing about extensions being considered or proposed. Okay, and so that that drop the the date that it's required to be submitted or approved by by um, the council is January thirty first, two thousand fifteen. And is that the date that we would then be subject to the four-year reporting period if we did not meet unless an extension was made? So that's real. I mean, I guess the question is if we were between a first and second reading and, you know, the city had a had approved it but not adopted it would would we get hung up because it took us two more weeks to to actually adopt it i don't i don't know that the state is going to draw that hard a line on us so you know there may be some wiggle room in terms of a second reading you know you i mean i i, I wouldn't i wouldn't say that because we hadn't had a second reading by that particular date that we're automatically on the hook uh, but, for a four-year review but if we made a any significant changes to this, then it would need to go back to the state again for another review. Um, is that correct? You mean if you, we submit it in whatever form you authorize it to be submitted and then in the next round of public hearings you make significant changes? Yes. Yes, we would want to re-review those with HCD. And again, that becomes sort of a case by case. You know, if we do this and we're in a very active process with them or are they again, again going to hold us to a specific date I don't want to speculate on that historically they've been you know if, if we're working toward that and you have a unique situation like that they're typically you know my historically in other housing elements they were willing to work with you on that but again I'm not you know, these are a different set of rules and and I don't know that anybody's asked them the question frankly I haven't asked them the question at this okay. point um, but usually working in good faith towards the end goal um, would probably not put us into that penalty period immediately, chances are. Um, and then you, in this document, it um, has more units by 98 of surplus units that we are um, allowing for can you speak to that I'll, I'll speak to that um, so the the units is are really driven by the low and very low as well as moderate income and and so what we've what we have in surplus is largely due to existing zoning so what we're what we've zoned for or not zoned for yet, but proposed here is to um, have the overlay districts to just come up um, and see if I can find the number here. It's three units over those uh, very low to moderate income categories. So it's it's actually quite snug in terms of the numbers. It's the uh, the uh, market rate that that really doesn't drive the numbers is where we're way over okay and how does the effect of of mixed use affect the density or the availability of other units and low and ultra low units being able to be built on the site if we were to not have the mixed use in the overlay Could, um, could you repeat the question? I'm, I'm not sure what you're getting at. I know that we can't have all of our units built in a mixed-use area, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to get at why we would have a mixed-use rather than all residential. Um, is that to try to achieve low numbers, or is that to make it more attractive? I think that was intended more of a planning issue is that there were an area that made sense for mixed use and maybe an area that would made more sense for standalone residential so that was really more of a planning decision you could you could achieve everything by just doing residential only zoning 
that would be the case. But if you wanted to add mixed use to that, then again, we'd get back to what the numbers, because that would be fine from a planning standpoint, but then we have to make sure the numbers matched up, right? But wouldn't having that one level, you know, normally mixed use is, you know, one level of retail with a couple stacked apartment levels or, you know, however many you want to go up, um, wouldn't that add more low housing if that were not in that zone? I think the density is, is kind of an independent issue. You can get achieve a certain density, because that's really what's driving it, is the number of units per acre. And you can do that in a, you know, two stories above commercial, or you can do it as a standalone um, project with residential. So I think it's really the density. Could you achieve more density in a mixed use? Maybe, because maybe it's a different product type. It's smaller units or studios or because of a different lifestyle potentially. But I think that's more, it's still a density question. That's what the state's interested in. You know, you could say, you know, it might be that you could comfortably accommodate 30 to the acre in a mixed use format versus a smaller I'm, number. I'm trying to go the other direction and say that if we didn't have mixed use, we could probably go 20 to the acre because we're setting minimums, not maximums. Mm -hmm. The minimums are what are important to the driving factor for these numbers, which is the driving factor for this whole pile of paper that we have, is to get the numbers that um, the state will agree we are um, attempting to zone for the ho probability of housing, not that we're trying to zone for the probability of um, businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if we could change the um, ratio of low to moderate by reducing the amount of mixed use and just planning for the actual um, housing units that were required to plan for. I'll, I'll let Ken jump in, but if I'm getting this wrong, but right now what we're proposing is the, on the mixed use is the minimum the, the minimum minimum density, 20 units to the acre. Right. So if we propose any lower density, we won't get credit for any of it as low mod, even if it's in a residential, strictly a residential format. But we could still leave it as 20 units per acre without that, and it would be more likely a shorter, smaller, less footprint development because you wouldn't be having to allot for the... 100,000 100, square feet of, of mixed of use. Mixed sure. use. It's ground floor. So yeah, I think that becomes a planning decision for, for the council if if you want to restrict that parcel or those parcels to a, uh, you know, residential only that, you know, that that's your call. You'll achieve the numbers. That's absolutely the case. Okay. And and I think that's something that when we get to discussion we can talk about. Um, the other question I had for staff was you had mentioned um, changing the lot size and, and, and that it may encourage um, some secondary dwelling sizes. And how many, in the last RENA housing cycle, um, how many secondary units got built in Brisbane? So we, we have on average one a year that's, that we've, uh, included uh, essentially in that you see with the uh, table 35 is we're claiming credit for seven units it's a seven year cycle which translates to one per year so that's the the past trend and and typically you would expect the the secondary units to be smaller more affordable units but i see none of them are listed in the low or very low they're all listed in moderate Actually, if you go to the second chapter of the housing element, there's a long discussion about how affordable secondary dwelling units actually are. Conservatively, though, we've included them in the category of moderate income because we have no way of restricting the rents on those second units. Uh, and the state in the past, in reviewing the housing element, had indicated that they were not going to give credit for these second units as being low or very low. 
So that's an ongoing discussion that we've had with the state um, over how to characterize these units. But we've taken a conservative position in, in this housing element. Okay, and that conservative position, when it came back to you know waiving the fee for secondary units of five or seven hundred dollars to you know go through the planning process for a secondary unit, if those are for moderate housing, why would we be waiving a fee that is so low that costs us that much to, or even contemplating waiving a fee that is you know three months of our water bill or equal to? Um, I actually believe. Um, this is probably something that we should discuss further with the city attorney, but if the city were to waive a permit fee, that might be a financial contribution, and we might have some leverage to then impose some kind of rent control. Um, I, I think that was in an earlier version of policy, pro excuse me, program HB1E, that laundry list of potential secondary units. Um, programs but but if if it's a five hundred dollar fee um, how likely would it be that a, a person who's willing to build a secondary unit if they're planning not for a personal use to guarantee that they're going to charge below market rate but, rent but this is actually the case that a good number of these are for personal use right um, so they may not have um, that concern uh, for example, secondary units are designed for the occupant, the owner, to occupy and then rent out the rest of the house. Mm -hmm. So in such a case as that, they might have no problem with agreeing to future rent restrictions to get that fee waived up front. So it's, it's a possibility. Well, in, in the past, it has seemed that, um, you know, smallness is one of the ways to make it affordable. Um, but that's certainly not the case in today's market necessarily. Um, and then I had some questions about the possibility of changing the um, plan development permits up at the um, landmark at the ridge for making them into multifamily home, subdividing homes. I guess what, what was suggested was to imp uh, impose the same or uh, let me say, impose or allow them to do the same things that other residences in, in Brisbane can do in the village or in central Brisbane, which is to establish a secondary unit in the existing footprint of a home, assuming they meet all the same development standards. That would be the intent. the only questions I had for staff. If I can interrupt for one second to jump back um, earlier, um, Council Member Miller asked about the Palmer case, and that is actually a California Court of Appeal decision. It's not a uh, decision of the California Supreme Court. Um, but the Supreme Court did deny rehearing. So, so can I say that again, the last sentence? The, the, the California Supreme Court denied rehearing. In other words, the parties requested that the California Supreme Court take the case up from the uh -huh. Court of Appeal, and uh, the, the Supreme Court denied rehearing. Okay. So this is a Court of Appeal decision. It is good law in California, okay. um, but it is not a decision of the California Supreme Court. Okay, great. So I thank wanted you. to correct my earlier statement. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I understand this is not a public hearing, but I do have a slip for the public to speak. And unless there's an objection, I would like to open it up to public comment. So I have a slip from Michelle Salmon. Michelle Salmon, Brisbane resident. I think this is my third round of Rena. Um, 
negotiations with the city of Brisbane, and it still pisses me off every time it gets crammed down our throats by the state of California. But I have a lot of problems with this proposal, and I'm just going to tell you what they all are. Um, first of all, I'm leery about submitting this to the state as it is, unless we have it buttoned down the way we want it to be, because what we submit is what they're going to then expect us to approve, and I have a lot of problems with what's here. Um, I'm really curious about what they consider to be low and moderate income for us because San Mateo County is the second highest median income county in the state of California, second only to Marin. So when they call it, when they talk about low and moderate income housing, I'm, I'm assuming that's countywide, uh, not statewide and that type of thing. Um, I'm a little concerned about uh, converting Crocker Industrial Park to um, a residential. It's a slippery slope, and the next thing you know, we're a complete bedroom community after fighting so hard to get Crocker Industrial Park as an industrial park in the sphere of influence in the city of Brisbane. I mean, we basically traded the mountain of the Northeast Ridge for Crocker Industrial Park um, under threat of the county. So I really have a hard time taking that and converting it to you look at me like you don't understand what I'm talking about, Lori. Yeah, okay, but when we made the agreement with the county to allow the Northeast Ridge development, it was because the county threatened to take the whole thing and give it to Daly City, including Crocker Industrial Park. And that's part of the reason the great compromise was made to allow development at the Northeast Ridge so that Brisbane, it became part of Brisbane and not Daly City. And it was all about Crocker Industrial Park and the revenue that generates for the city of Brisbane. So I have a hard time. Converting that to housing as the state crams it down our throats. Um, and there are a lot of concerns over that because of uh, the mixed use and the problems we have with lighting and traffic and, and um, you know, people in housing areas breathing more and more diesel fumes because it is an industrial area. And we've had a lot of conflicts already with um, the industry in Crocker Industrial Park and the development at the Northeast Ridge. The development in the Northeast Ridge is a whole other uh, problem for me. I absolutely am opposed to us allowing secondary units in the houses and landmark at the Ridge. That was originally supposed to be condominiums. Um, the city made an agreement that they would reduce the number of units from 492 units down to 500 condominium units down to 571 or something like that, single-family residences, and that is what they are now, with very large footprints that is almost equal to the amount of space that the original condominiums would have taken up. And it has really a lot of implications environmentally for the mountain. It is a sensitive area. It's part of the HCP, and I strongly object to any changes in that agreement. It needs to be enforced. Um, without We didn't... we. Brisbane City Council voted to accept that agreement, said that they would stand by it, agreed not to do a new environmental impact review on the addendum of, of the Northeast Ridge for building out the rest of the 71 homes in endangered habitat. I do not think that we should open the door to double the density in that area by allowing secondary units in these huge 4,000 square foot homes that we have allowed to be built there. I think they need to stand as they are. They have CCNRs that already aren't being enforced the way they should, and uh, that is of great concern. It's part of the Habitat Conservation Plan area. How would you handle the assessment on secondary units in terms of funding the HCP? Brings up a lot of questions. Um, it, it, the, the council promised to uphold the development agreement, and I don't consider opening it to secondary units upholding the development agreement. I consider that very wrong. It's an environmentally sensitive area. It would include other problems like additional parking, water, traffic, sewer. Is the current water tank have the capacity to double the amount of residents in that area? I doubt it. Um, and I feel that that's the same with the mega mansions that have already been built and are planned to be built in the Brisbane Acres and some of the other sensitive habitat interface areas, such as San Diego Court, uh, some of the <coughs> for Annis Road and, and Harris 
whatever out that way. I don't feel that I feel it's a it's a perversion of the acres ordinances for low density housing on the Brisbane acres to build a 5,000 square foot home and then subdivide it into you know secondary units uh, after the fact. I think that's wrong. I think that's totally wrong. Um, and there again, you have the same problems of uh, density in sensitive habitat areas and is directly and contrary to what we've been trying to achieve here in Brisbane with preserving the mountain and preserving the open space and the conservation areas. I think that in regular Brisbane, um, if I buy a home in an area that's zoned for R1, a single family dwelling uh, with minimum lot sizes, Am I going to be happy if the property next door is suddenly, you know, two units, more traffic, more cars, more people, more density, less open space? Even within the same footprint, it creates a parking problem. It, it creates a density difference. So I think you need to tread lightly there as well. Um, and uh, you are opening the doors to basically a lot of um, much more dense uh, population and dense housing and dense denseness in central Brisbane created quite a problem the last housing uh, um, uh, process we went through when we uh, changed the density in the R2 zone on San Bruno Avenue and said people had to have a density equal to 20 acre 20 units per acre um, and that meant that people like my brother couldn't remodel his house couldn't add a bedroom, couldn't do anything to his house without incurring having to go up to a density level of 20 units per acre. Well, when people really understood what the council had voted for, they were up in arms and they came in and they had to change that. So I'd be very careful about, about that. Um, I think that one of the other problems we have there is that it re really reduces the quality of life because some people are always going to want exceptions. They're going to want two units on a 4,800 square foot lot, and then they're going to want two units on a 3,000 square foot lot, and then they're going to want two units on a 25 foot wide lot. And the next thing you know, they're going to be asking for variances on lot lines and encroachment, and it just gets more and more dense as time goes on. And we lose the character of what Brisbane is, which is the ability to be able to breathe and have, you know, animals and plants and, and the environment. You know, we have an obligation to protect. Um, I'm concerned about the height of the buildings that are being planned for Crocker Industrial Park. Um, height of buildings changes the environment. We are, the whole Crocker Industrial Park is a sensitive habitat in the middle of a greater sensitive habitat. It is a watershed. It, it, it is an, a very important vital area. It is surrounded by endangered species habitat. Um, and it's, I've said this numerous times, it's not about a butterfly or a frog. It's about the quality of our entire life and the living environment that we support. And when you build buildings that are three and four story high, there are a lot of animals and insects and birds that cannot now transverse the area that they used to be able to do that. It's one of the reasons why, Clippy, um, why Ice House Hill no longer has the clippy, because the development on the Northeast Ridge and the development of that industrial park at North Hill, um, that area there, the buildings just are too tall, the trees are too tall, they've created an impediment for the butterflies to come back across to Calippe Hill, and now Ice House Hill is, is barren, it still has habitat, but there's there's no Calippe there anymore, and, and basically that's what you're talking about doing when you build three-story and higher structures in Crocker Industrial Park. And so I think that that's also a slippery slope. I am concerned about the water for the area. I am very concerned about giving a plan to the state that lists us as being willing, able to build 391 units when we're only having 293 crammed down our throats because Sure enough, when we go into the next cycle, they'll say, well, you didn't do all 391 units, so you still owe us another 300 units from that cycle, and let's just add it to, you know. I'm sorry, I don't, th I think that's a really bad idea, because it means that we're open to building that number of units. Um, 
just to achieve our low and moderate income housing, as Terry said. And if I understood what was said correctly earlier, you cannot use units in a mixed use facility as low income housing. So in other words, any units in a mixed commercial facility, am I correct? No? That's what I thought I heard, that those cannot account, you know. Only 50, you can only get uh, credit for 50%. For 50%, yeah. And I think it's a shame I agreed with what Ray said about how the state just continues to cram this down our throats without thought or consideration to what's really needed because most people who qualify for to per would qualify to purchase low income housing or moderate income housing would not be able to afford to purchase low income housing or moderate income housing and so it does not serve by any means the population that needs to be served and what we really do need is low income rental units that are not Geneva Towers and not the projects. And so I find this whole process just to be a bastardization of a good idea gone way bad in the state of California. And when we succumb to it and not fight against it, um, we are allowing it to happen. And I expect better of Brisbane than to allow this to happen. And I seriously, seriously object to us allowing secondary units in either Landmark at the Ridge or the Brisbane Acres when uh, people have already done density transfers, etc., to keep that as a low-density, sensitive habitat area, and especially with the planned development at the Northeast Ridge. I'm sorry. That perverts every agreement that this council or the previous council, the city council of the city of Brisbane made and it disgusts me that they would even consider that. It's already bad enough that we do not uphold the CCNRs and the agreements and the development that were made. So thank you. Thank you. So would anyone else of the public like to speak on this? So we can close the public well, discussion. Not, well, there's yeah, it's not really a public hearing, so just conversation. So, <laughs> now, <laughs> council discussion. Well, I have a, like you said, you have opinions, and I've already expressed my frustration at this whole dysfunctional process. Um, I guess the, the, the personal problem that I have is um, I really haven't been a part of this entire, I don't know, seven or eight years of consideration of how to deal with this mess that the state and the local regional keep imposing upon us. Um, and also, of course, the, the, the economic realities that, in my opinion, this doesn't address at all. Um, and so I feel not really connected to the decisions that have been made and why they've been made and you know what we should do and 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 so I I, I just don't feel ready to you know to take any action and uh, I, I guess I feel very uncomfortable putting something forward that even though I know um, it's just for the state to review it, it does really communicate to them that we have in mind actually doing some of these things uh, or that we have you know kind of approved these things as something that you know we really are behind and I'm not so sure it, more, mostly because I just haven't been a part of this process uh, that I'm really comfortable with all of this uh, and so I guess the first thing I want to say is uh, I just need some more time to, to digest all of this. I mean, the amount of paperwork that we were supposed to digest in a week and the planning commission to spend two years on it, plus all the previous stuff, um, you know, it was just more than I can digest. I mean, I looked at it, but I just haven't been able to digest it. It's just way too much to, to take in. Um, and, and I had just all kinds of questions of why did we pick that property rather than this property? And, you know, we can't go through all of that tonight, you know, but. Um, I guess 
kind of, I, I didn't really want to start arguing with my colleague here, but, but I kind of think that maybe the property behind the village makes more sense to be residential than what we're, you know, telling people who are very viable business uh, places uh, that, you know, that they're going to be residential someday. Well, just the, the whole thing just doesn't make any sense. I, I can't absorb it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and I know people that, well, it's just games with the state. Well, I don't like playing just games with the state. It just bugs me to hell, you know. I mean, I, I'd like to, you know, put in something that at least we can feel comfortable that, that you know, that, that there's some kind of truth to this. Uh, and I just don't feel ready to, to say that about the material here. And I understand a lot of work has gone into this and a lot of thought and, um, a lot of effort, you know, to make it meet all these crazy standards that the state has imposed, um, but but I, I'm I'm just not ready to to, to buy it at this point. Um, there are just too many uncertainties, unknowns, uh, things that, that that I haven't heard good reasons for why we're doing it this way rather than that way. I mean, maybe this is the best uh, you know resolution of all these problems, but but I haven't been through the process to come to that conclusion. Lori? Would you like to take it? So I have a question to follow up on um, the comment you made, Terry, about, you know, well, why do we have to make the um, the property um, mixed use near the shopping center um, or on, on park place? Um, and my question to staff is, well, if we're going to have this affordable housing overlay and say that we'll potentially zone it as mixed use, does that require us then in the future to put in a commercial component? What, what if in the future we, we want to do just residential? Does that constrain us? That wouldn't constrain you on the housing element obligation. Mm -hmm. It'd be the other way around. If you committed too much, or you committed to a residential and you over designated mixed use you know because you do have that 50 percent cap we talked about that that would be you'd run into trouble but the other way around you don't run into trouble okay that's all i have for now you know i i, I hear where you're coming from you know as as i'm reading this thing there, there was a lot to absorb and um you know like the the penalty, you know, like, I understood the eight year again the extra bonus if you if you did it early. What, John? When did when did the four year thing kick in? That I, I didn't remember that. That's new with this cycle. So when we you know we're doing the the region wide, um, I forgot what they called it. You know, it was the San Mateo County. The Rena. Rena. Yeah, sub region. Sub region. There you go. Um, I, I never heard about the four-year penalty, but it was there, huh? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, just going through this document, there are a lot of like, different options, you know, and there's so many nuances that you can, can explore. Um, and sure, yeah, you know, we're definitely going to need to come back and, and, and really thoroughly go through this. Um, we should have a solid... Uh, housing element that really defines what the community wants and, you know, and, and help guide the structure of that element. Um, you know, trying to decide, you know, what is the best mix, it'll take, it'll take something like what we're doing on the third. Right, those types of visioning workshops, get, you know, getting feedback from the community. You know, what are the things that, again, it goes back to what do you like? What do you, what do you think can be enhanced? What do you think is missing? You know, and that and that's important. And I think one of the things that we've talked about, not just tonight, but many times, is is the need for affordable housing. And so, I remember when I was running for council the first time. And this is before the council, and they were struggling with, okay, where do we put these, these, um, these, um, where are we going to allocate the, the units? 
and they were looking at all kinds of crazy places. And and but then it, you, you know you you go back to the to the goals of the housing element, and 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 so that that was one of the things that that I did you know today, and it's on um, six six one. And you and you look at those those goals, and they're great goals, and and we should be very proud that that they're in there. You know, provide housing opportunities for all persons, maintain a diverse population, uh, preserve Brisbane's residential residential character, uh, ensure that new residential development is compatible with existing development, encourage compact infill mixed use and transit oriented. Development to reduce vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. Right? Um, you know, encourage sustainable residential development. Provide housing opportunities for people who work in Brisbane to reduce the vehicle miles traveled. Uh, ensure that housing development is not in urbanized area that is not in urbanized areas mitigates the infrastructure costs and impacts of development. So you know, we kind of you know talking about that a little bit tonight.